Good afternoon. Welcome to lecture six. Today we'll talk about market failure and government intervention. It will be one of the most interesting lectures of the entire semester. I hope that you will share this opinion with me. So let's get started and remember what we talked about last time. So previously in economics and society, we talked about monopolistic competition, Cournot oligopoly, Bertrand oligopoly, and collusion. So these were the three uh, different market approaches that we had in oligopoly. And then we had the monopolistic competition, which we said is a hybrid between a pure monopoly and a perfectly competitive market. And then in the end, last time, we had this video and we talked about the kinked demand model where some strange things happen because we have like a broken demand because firms react differently when somebody decreases the price and differently when somebody increases the price. And this results in a marginal revenue curve that is broken. And therefore, we might have changes in the marginal cost that will not lead to a change in price. And we have all these situation that creates a market rigidity there. Today, we are going to talk everything that we know so far about economics, and we are going to put it into a market perspective, and we will try to be as realistic as possible and see how mainly the target of today's lecture is how the government or some regulator can actually intervene and affect the results that we have in the market. Before that, though, let's see what is the need to do that. So today we'll talk about market failure and therefore government intervention. Market failure, price controls in perfectly competitive markets, in monopolistic markets. And then we will talk about antitrust. I will explain to you about the laws in the United States and the rest of the world and particularly in Singapore as well. And then we will talk about the video of externalities. And finally, I will introduce very briefly for just two slides, the public goods, and you will see a little bit what is the real use of the government. So let's get started with market failure. So I found uh, this very nice picture here. It's a, uh, I didn't understand like what uh, actually happening. Uh, I think it's a guy that he wants to make uh, dessert and he has to separate the sugar, so he put it on the table and he uses this razor to separate it into two parts so the dessert will not come out very, very sweet. That's, um, that's what I think. So uh, for some reason, I googled uh, the image market failure and this was one of the, of the ones that came up. I, I don't know why dessert making is so related to market failure, but what is market failure? Market failure is the situation where the market outcome is socially undesirable. Now, by market outcome, we mean a situation that the market actually gives you. This can be a perfect equilibrium. It can be a situation where the market, for some reason, fails to equilibrate for one reason or another. Maybe because of a human reason, maybe because of some strange situation that happens in this market. A lot of people say that market failure is, they confuse, and they say market failure is a situation where the market fails to reach an equilibrium. This is some kinds of market failure, but most of the market failure situations that we will just see now, they have to do with perfect functioning of the market, that market yields without a problem an equilibrium situation. All right, this brings us to the point to discuss about preferences of the society. Because if you have a solution in the market and the, mar and the society doesn't like it, this means that societies do have preferences. So they have like the social preferences, let's say. And different societies, even today, they have very different preferences. Like for example, uh, you can find in Singapore that marijuana is illegal, and not only illegal, but it's, it's seriously illegal. You can get in very deep trouble if you are caught having 
a, a serious quantity of marijuana here in Singapore. Like, I think you can even get the death penalty for that. Well, in other countries, marijuana is also illegal, but let's say, for example, in most countries in Europe, marijuana is illegal, but uh, what actually happens is that if, you, for example, in Greece, you are caught with having mar marijuana in your car, what's gonna happen to you is the same that's gonna happen to you if you make noise in the middle of the night and you wake up people. Okay, or if you are going drunk and you're going drunk outside and you are, uh, you are disturbing the public peace or something like that. So the penalties are not very heavy. In Singapore, the penalties are the heaviest possible. Right now, it should be one of the countries that has the, the heaviest uh, penalties for, for drugs. So we see there that there is a social preference against drugs. Now, if you go to Los Angeles, marijuana is totally legal. Like you go to, to a store and you buy marijuana in the same way that you would buy a bag of chips or something like that. It's totally legal. You pay uh, the employee, you get the, uh, you get the stuff, and then there will be taxes paid or that and, and everything. So the government is aware of this. Everything is totally legal. On the other hand, uh, prostitution is illegal in Los Angeles. Now, on the other hand, uh, in Tehran, in Iran, marijuana is okay. It's not illegal, but it's not legal either. So it's in a situation that they don't even bother with marijuana. They don't even care to, to say if it's legal or illegal. It's a, as every other weed that is uh, growing in, uh, in, in the fields. But they have a big problem there with alcohol, which most of the world doesn't have any problem with alcohol in particular. But in, in Tehran, they, for religious reasons, they do not like people to, to, drink, uh, to, to drink alcohol. Okay, it's something that they consider that is bad. So this has to do, again, with social preferences. So every country has this, that they like one thing and they don't like another, except, except Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, everything is legal. Like you can smoke a joint of marijuana and drinking hard alcohol at the same time and have like hired 11 sex workers and have a big party. Okay, so there is no... Uh, preference against those things in Amsterdam, everything is legal, while in different jurisdictions you have very different preferences. So societies do have preferences. If the market gives you something that the market is perfectly okay for the market, is an equilibrium solution, but in the real society, in the preference of the society, this is disliked, then we have a situation of market failure. There are many types of market failure. First of all, you have monopolies that they are known to produce inefficiencies. Inefficiency by definition is a failure. You are not going to like that the market is inefficient. No way anybody is going to like other than the monopolist who makes tons of money. Everybody else in the society jointly, they will not like uh, this inefficiency situation, but also you can have perfectly competitive markets which exhibit a 100% economic efficiency and uh, the society may dislike the equilibrium. Like for example, a uh, uh, long time ago, uh, till the 1st of May of, uh, the 1st of May of 2007, I was a smoker. I was smoking for almost uh, a year, not more than that. I started uh, kind of late in my life, and I uh, I went for a year by being a normal smoker, and then I quit. And um, I liked smoking back then. Smoking is okay. I still don't have any problem with smoking. What bothers me is chemotherapy. That's that's what I, I don't like. Smoking, I like it, but I have a problem with chemotherapy and dying from cancer, which is, I'm not sure if I like it or not. So I decided to quit smoking, and from 2007 till now, I have uh, never smoked again. But back then, when I was smoking, there was uh, something very funny happen happening almost all, all the time. So I used to order from Greece, from my country, uh, not uh, normal cigarettes, but just uh, plain tobacco. So this was a tobacco that was coming in a bag, and then you could get like uh, little papers, and you could put the, the tobacco inside, and then also there was, uh, you could buy filters, little filters, and you would make your, roll your own cigarette. And this is something that now, especially in Europe, a lot of people are doing. Like it's kind of has become a lot of mainly mainstream, let's say. But back then in 2006, nobody, nobody knew about that uh, outside of Greece. Okay, so Greece was a tobacco producing country and the producers, the farmers, they didn't buy the cigarettes. They just kept 
a little bit of their own tobacco and they used to roll their own cigarettes. So we have a tradition of just doing that. While in the rest of Europe, uh, they adapted it much later, like many other things like uh, democracy, philosophy, and all these things that we started first in Greece. Uh, algebra, um, trigonometry, uh, science, uh, uh, medical science, all these, uh, we started there and then it became a fashion everywhere else. So I had this habit of rolling my own cigarettes. And in the US, nobody knew about that. Like in the US, the only cigarette you had to roll yourself was not very legal. So I remember I had like my, my pouch of, of tobacco and I was going out and uh, being in a, in a bar, let's say, for economic research, of course. And I was sitting there drinking my tea and uh, I wanted to roll a cigarette. So I will take out my pouch and I will take a little paper and I will start rolling my own cigarette. And then people would see me and they would be like, what is this guy doing? And then they will come to my table. Like this was like a best way, uh, the best icebreaker. Like you could make new friends all the time. They could come there and they would be like, man, what is that? What do you have in there? What do, do, why do you do that here? You're not afraid. So they thought that I'm doing something that was illegal, like that this was not normal tobacco. And then I was like, no, I'm not afraid. You know, I was playing cool and everything. And then they would sooner or later understand that this was not like the good stuff. It was just tobacco. Okay, so uh, when they understood that it was tobacco, it was like, ah, oh, get out of here. That's just tobacco, okay. And they would just sit there a little bit and see how I roll it and how can I make it like so cylindrical and everything. And then they would go um, from where they came from. So the lesson here is that even though illegal drugs are illegal, there is a demand for those. Okay, all these people that they came there, they were like, oh, this is, uh, this is a good stuff. Like, uh, uh, oh, you have so much, can I have some? Okay, so the, it was, there was a demand. And of course, as you have seen in movies, or if you have traveled to the US or anywhere in Europe, you can see like in the corner of the street, there's a lot of supply also. So there's a demand, there is supply, and there's no problem for the market to equilibrate. The thing is that we do not like this particular outcome. We just do not like it. Okay, so societies have ruled that we do not like that everybody will be high and they will be going out in the streets and they will be in the situations like that. So in some particular societies, they will keep this opinion and they are like that for, for now and for many years to come. Even in the United States, that in some states it is legal to have to, to smoke marijuana, for example, in other states, it is not legal. So you have these social preferences that they change, even though the market as market has no problem whatsoever to equilibrate, and actually it's a pretty efficient market. So let's talk about kinds of market uh, failures. First of all, prices may fail to reflect the real cost of what is being produced. Usually, if I produce something and I put it up for sale, the final price will include all the costs there. If it doesn't include all the costs, I will be making losses. But what if some of the costs that, are, that they are incurred in order to make something, they are not paid by the producer and the producer doesn't care. Here's an example. This product, the plastic bag, is a product that its price does not reflect its cost because the cost of resources in order to make it is pretty small, but the cost of disposing it after you use it, it's pretty high. So the price does not reflect the cost of disposal, it reflects only the cost of making it, which is pretty negligible. So the supermarket will give it to you for free just together, included in the price of, of, uh, of the uh, products that you buy. All right, so most of the supermarkets, I think here in Singapore, they will not uh, really sell you a bag. All right, it's uh, in, uh, in, in European Union right now, it's illegal to not charge for plastic bags. And actually there is also a minimum price. The reason for that is because when you do not charge the right price for this, people will get a lot. Like uh, for example, by, uh, still uh, the, the bags became uh, they got a minimum price, I think, two years ago in Greece. 
And my father still has bags that he got for free from the supermarket, like for the last 10 years, he would get like 10 bags every time. And then he would roll them and keep them. Like he has like a, a stash of, of bags just for, you know, for difficult times or st stuff like that. Okay. And he has like, he, he even like rolls them uh, together and he puts like rubber bands around them. And he has a really, he has a stash. And every time he would, I mean, the old times, he would go to the supermarket, he would get more than enough. Like he would get the bag and then he would put some bags because they had them laying around there. And he would put some, some spare bags in his bag so he would have more. Why? Because they were free. Now that they are nine euro cents per bag, uh, he brings his own bag from home because he still doesn't want to go in his stash and, and consume all these bags that he has. So he still gets like, uh, the, the, uh, the same bag back and forth to the supermarket all the time. Why? Because now the price is right. In the, uh, back in the time, it was not right. And that's why all these, uh, they are now in, in, every, uh, in every part of the sea, even very deep down in the ocean, you can find plastic bags from the uh, supermarkets in, the, in another continent. All right, uh, another kind of uh, market failure is that the market may fail to allocate the good to those who value it the most, to those who are, who are willing to actually uh, pay the most for that. And here is one example, the best example now for the times. Remember what happened in the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak. In the beginning, you had all these people that they went and they stashed a lot of, lots of masks. And they got, especially the N95 masks, it was impossible to find in the beginning. Or if you could find the little ones that the uh, supply chains could actually make, they were extremely expensive. So you had all these people that they were sitting at home doing nothing and they had a stash of N95 uh, masks. And then you could see that the health professionals, they didn't have, that they really needed them. They didn't have them. And actually it was impossible for them to get it because, uh, it, the prices were so high that some of the governments, they were not able to even afford to buy them. And even when they, they could buy them, they didn't have such a sufficient quantities that they will have for all health, health professionals. So in the beginning, we had all this mess up with, with the masks and even the World Health Organization, they went out and they lied to people and they said, no, no, masks are not protecting you from the virus, so people will let go so that health professionals will go and have masks, which is actually not a nice thing at all, but shows a way that they tried to actually fight this market failure that we had in this instance. The third type of market failure is that the market may fail to produce the good in the minimum opportunity cost. And the uh, very recent example that we had that is a graph that we had last time with monopolistic competition where we saw that the market should go to B. This would be the maximum efficiency, but instead it goes to point A and it goes to point A because uh, the uh, firms there, they do have excess supply. So we had this slide that we explained uh, all this in monopolistic competition and we saw there that you are not producing in the minimum opportunity cost, you are producing at another that is not the minimum and you cannot do anything about it. So this is another type of market failure. Last time we discussed about it and we said that usually this is small and we do not bother that much with it because usually the regulators, they have much more serious problems to deal with. But in general, this doesn't mean that this is not a problem. Number four, is that the market may produce a good that fails to cover the real needs of the society. And this is a, um, uh, makes me always smile because I, um, I have this example that uh, I was watching YouTube several years ago and uh, YouTube has progressed a lot through, through the years. Like 10 years ago, you could only find like some amateur videos of people pranking each other and videos with cats. Now you can find like, uh, some of the most elaborate documentaries and you can learn a lot. Uh, I remember this time that uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was just browsing on YouTube and I found a video that the guy was, uh, was uh, testing how, uh, how fragile the new iPhones were. It was uh, back when iPhone 7 came out and I had an iPhone 5 back then, which uh, my screen had just broken. 
And the, the advertisement for the new iPhone, the iPhone 7 back then, was that the iPhone, the new iPhone has a, this Gorilla Glass or however they call it, which is not very fragile. So I wanted to see how the new product was less fragile or if it was less fragile. And I searched on YouTube and a YouTuber came out and he was like, oh, I'm testing the new iPhone and the new Galaxy that was back then. I don't remember which one it was. Uh, how uh, I, he was dropping them from different heights and how, uh, when they're gonna break. And I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting. Let's watch it. So I watched that and of course, YouTube will show you another video. And then it's the same YouTuber that actually is testing the two phones now for something else, which you have to be aware of because your phone might be in danger for that. So he was putting the phones in Coca-Cola and then he would put it in the freezer for one day and we'll see if the phones could actually survive that. And this is very useful because you do not know it, but what if you have like a Tupperware full of Coca-Cola sitting around and then you walk and then accidentally you drop your phone in there and you don't understand it, and then you close the Tupperware and you put it in the freezer, and then it freezes, you know, when you have to freeze Coca-Cola in a Tupperware, and then you want to see if your phone will survive that. And actually, none of the phones survived that, or even if they did, I don't remember now, uh, even if they did, uh, it would be worthless to have a phone that now has a little bit of Coca-Cola inside, but still, still works. And it was a total waste of, using two phones in order to perfectly uh, brand new phones that he even took them out uh, from the box to, to do this test. And I realized in the beginning, I thought this was totally stupid. Then I realized that this video had back then had something like 2 million views. Now YouTube pays you something like $2,000 per million views in the United States. Somebody who has some, uh, some good advertisement to, to viewing ratio, so they will pay you like around 2,000 American dollars for each uh, million views. So this video had two, two and a half million. So he actually made the money that these phones cost back then. So this was around uh, less than $1,000 for each one of them. So he made a profit from that. He made a substantially good profit. And then several years ago, when I wanted to make this, I wanted to find the frame for that, like to find something to put uh, in the picture here. And I went like iPhone for Coca-Cola and these videos, like the whole YouTube had at least 30, 40 videos like that. This particular guy, he makes the same video for every new model of iPhone comes out. So this is something that somebody can claim that this is not the correct use for something. Like you just take an expensive phone and you mess it up just to create this kind of situation. But the discussion there is very big because if you think about it, the same thing happens in every James Bond movie. Uh, well, they take a perfectly good car, always, usually it's an Aston Martin or a, a Maserati or stuff like that. And you know, like uh, James Bond is uh, driving his new car that has all these uh, gadgets inside and everything. But at some point, you know, he will jump out of the car and the car will destroy because the bad guys are after him and everything. So it's exactly the same thing. Like somebody can claim that, yeah, they destroy this. It's production value for making something that people want to see brand new phones to be destroyed and they have fun with that. So uh, there is some people that they say this is okay. Some other people, they say, no, that's totally stupid. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge waste of resources. Okay, you may have a failure, you may not, but this is an example also of the ambiguity that you have here. Number five, the market may fail to control the abuse of monopoly power. And there is like uh, now a new example of monopoly power like all the time is uh, these guys right here, which is the only thing that is uh, even now with the COVID-19 situation, like the whole economy is wiped out and Amazon is making more money. Like it seems to me that even if there is like a nuclear explosion or a meteorite falls on earth and everything is destroyed, two things are gonna remain and prosper, cockroaches and Amazon who will find a way even if there is a nuclear disaster to still make more money. I don't know what they will be selling, but they will still be making more money. So it seems that there is abuse of market power. Right now that there is a pre-election period in the United States and the situation seems that it's, be, it's, it's becoming very volatile, you have a lot of 
different sides and they are talking about what about antitrust guys? What about um, bringing a little bit Google to give us some explanation of what they are doing and Amazon to tell us a little bit, like for example, the Democrats are against uh, the big tech and the Republicans are against Amazon and they are discussing about who they are going to go after because they think that there is abuse of monopoly power and they have to do something about it. And we will see a little later today how this works. Number six, consumers may fail to evaluate the consequences of the use of a product. And this is something that, again, there is a very big discussion with that because the consumer consumes something and they, some of the times they care about their satisfaction that they get at the time of consumption, but they are not smart enough to deal with the aftermath. And here we have all the products that they cause addiction or all the products that they actually get you in a situation that you cannot predict the outcome of those. Like for example, uh, the opioid crisis in the United States, which actually takes the form of an epidemic that nothing can be done with that because the COVID-19 situation, super serious case of, uh, of, an, uh, of a pandemic that you have a lot of people dying from that, but lots of sciences, now they claim that the years of life, not the amount of people that they die, but the years of life that they are taken from COVID-19 are not that many because those people that they die from this disease, they actually, some of them, the life expectancy that they have because of their health situation or their age is not that, uh, that high. But the epidemic of the opioids actually takes something like 71,000 lives, this is the, a real number that comes out only from the US. We're talking about the legal drugs. These were the deaths from uh, opioids in general in the United States. And you had 51,000 deaths that was because of one single medication, fentanyl. Fentanyl killed 51,000 people only in 2019 only in the United States. And most of them, they were people that they had many, many years of life ahead of them. They were people that they were in the most productive age and they, will, uh, they were wiped off because of this situation that they failed to evaluate the use of this product has some very pleasant consequences now, like getting high on fentanyl is uh, uh, causing a... Uh, your, homo your hormones to explode in such a way that is like uh, the, one of the most pleasant feelings that the human brain can actually handle. And then for the rest of your life, you're going to be dependent on that and it will be very difficult for you to get out of this. There are people that they have been addicted to these kind of medications for reasons that they weren't it, like they went through operations and they weren't they went through pain and they were prescribed those medications and then it was almost impossible for them to get out of their use so you have this situation right now and we say okay so it seems that you have a perfectly legal market there that does much more harm than some of the illegal illegal markets are doing because you do not have 50,000 deaths from marijuana, actually, you have zero deaths from marijuana. The only, uh, the only danger that you have if you have too much marijuana is that you're gonna laugh so much that you, you may die laughing or, or something like that, but you are not going to overdose. While with some perfectly legal substances, you can overdose very easily and you have like 50,000 deaths in just one year from that. And finally, the market may fail to equilibrate for various reasons. This is what there are people usually believe that market failure is. So this is one out of seven uh, types of market failure. So most of the times the market equilibrates just fine, but there are some cases that the market fails to equilibrate. Like for example, you can see this, a person looking for a job, unemployed, and sometimes uh, unemployed for a, for a long term. And at the same time that you see this, you will also see that. So you see that there are, vacant positions and there is unemployed people, uh, employers who look for employees and employees who look for employers and there is a problem matching those two. So you will see that these are real problems of 
having a, a situation that you have the demand, you have the supply, but they fail to find each other and this market fails to equilibrate. We will see very extensively why this happens when we talk about uh, the labor market in a later lecture. But for now, you have to understand that this is also another form of market failure. All right, so what can we do about market failure? You can regulate. We can intervene into the market and try to solve the problem. So regulation is a response to market failure. Intervention may lead to the improvement of the social welfare. So you can actually intervene in the market and fix something that was wrong. But most of the times you may have winners and losers. So yes, you do fix the problem in some cases. In some other cases, you can actually make it much worse Okay, don't forget that. You should know what you're doing. And we will see some examples that uh, some people got uh, trigger happy and they, they tried to overregulate the market and they damaged it. Okay, so you can have this. But even if you do the perfect job with respect to regulation, still you may cause winners and losers. You may have some side effects that they are not going to be very pleasant. And we will see exactly how this works. You have two types of a regulatory intervention, two types that you can intervene and fix things, two different tools. The first is by doing it directly, but with direct government intervention. So government has actually uh, a, a reason to intervene in some cases and try to fix things. That's why people vote for government. It's one of the main reasons why we have governments today. So regulation may target the prices, the quality of the product, the variety, uh, try to prevent a failing market outcome. Like for example, uh, you may have price controls and many other things. Like for example, uh, you cannot today as things are, if I take for example, uh, uh, a piece of metal and I put four wheels in it and just a box on top with one glass in front, I cannot sell this as a car because the government has some particular regulation that say, if you want to take permission to sell a car, it should meet some specific characteristics of safety. You may have some particular regulations that they do not allow you to take everything and sell it as anything. Okay, the market is not actually as free as we think. Some of the products, they do have some particular specifications. They should have some particular specifications in order to be sold. Like for example, you cannot sell something that the battery will explode from time to time, or you cannot sell something that will put the people in risk of safety or risk of uh, harm in health or, or stuff like that. So there are direct regulations that they go after all this. And number two is by not changing the outcomes of the game, like number one, but by changing the rules of the game. So the government will actually intervene. And instead of targeting the market outcome, they will alter the rules of competition. For example, antitrust. Say, so, okay, guys, if you have 30% of the market, and the other guy has another 30% of the market, and you want to merge, sorry, you cannot. And if you try, I'm going to prevent that, and I'm going to fine you because I think that if you do that, you are going to become a monopoly. Say, well, wait a second. This company is my property, and that other company is the property of the other guy. And we want to pull together our properties and make a bigger property and just face the market like that. This is not allowed. No, it's not. Okay, so it's not as free. The enterprise is not as free as we think. And this will take you back to lecture number one that we talked about market systems. And we said that we are not a totally laissez-faire uh, market and we are not a totally command economy. What actually are, we're a mixture between the two. So there are things that they are allowed and there are some things that they are not allowed. And to what is allowed, there are always limits. So this is with respect to the definition of market failure. What is a market failure and why is it important and why we are interested in intervening to the market failure. Let's go now to try to see how price control works. And let's start with the easy case, which is the perfectly competitive market. So first of all, we have a price ceiling. So let's assume that we have this market 
a totally perfectly competitive market, totally normal, with its well-behaved supply curve and uh, well-behaved demand curve, and you have an equilibrium at point A, which yields price P star and a quantity, a total quantity in the market Q star. Now, the government comes in this market and says that, okay, so this price is too high, like uh, the photo showed before, the rent is uh, pretty damn high. So government comes and says, yes, the price is uh, pretty damn high, and I have to do somewhere something to lower the price. And what is uh, easier for the government other than coming and saying, okay, here's a bill, and uh, according to this bill, you cannot charge anything above P max. So the maximum price you can charge for this particular product is P max. Now, I want you to notice in this graph that if you want to impose a price ceiling, uh, this price, price ceiling will be meaningful only if you have it below the actual price in the market, the equilibrium price in the market. If you put it above the equilibrium price, then uh, nobody will care for the price ceiling because the market is not constrained. The price ceiling is not binding, in other words. So in order for the constraint to be binding, it should prevent you from going to the actual equilibrium. So what happens in this particular market now is that the government does not allow you to go to anywhere above Pmax. Okay, the, the, the part of the graph above this red dotted line is totally unattainable now. You cannot equilibrate there. You can equilibrate anywhere on the red line or below it. That's what it means, a P max there. All right, if you do that, automatically, you have to assume how, you have to, to assess how the members of this market will react. Let's start with the demand. So the quantity demanded will increase from Q star to QD because price is now cheap and consumers are like, woohoo, the price now is very cheap. Let's go and, and get more of this thing because the price is lower than what we used to pay before. So that's good news for the consumers, at least to begin with. Now, the producers, on the other hand, are not very happy with that because they're like, okay, so if I have to charge P max, which is much lower than P star than I was doing before, then I'm not very interested in producing too much of this product. Many of the producers will be like, it's not worth it anymore. I'm going to go do uh, uh, something else. All right. So you may have the situation that you will have a lot of producers exiting the market in this case, or maybe not exit, but they will produce less because at this price, they cannot cover their costs. So you have a quantity supplied QS, a quantity demanded QD. You see here that the quantity demanded exceeds quantity supply. So you have a shortage, which is equal to the distance B to C or C to B. All right, so this distance is the shortage. Yeah, you can calculate this if you take QD and you subtract QS from that. So producers at this new situation, they will go to point C, they will produce QS, and therefore consumers will only be able to buy quantity QS. Quantity from QS to QD will not be transacted because simply is not produced. So therefore, you have the quantity to go down to QS. You have the price, of course, because of the legislation to go down to Pmax. So producers will sell less at a lower price. They will sell QS at Pmax instead of Q star at P star. So you see here that they get less quantity at a lower price. So producers are totally screwed in this particular regulation in the market. Consumers now will actually, some of them will be better off, some of them will be worse off. Uh, the ones that they will be worse off are the ones that they have demand along the uh, segment of the demand EA. So those people now, they will not be able to buy anything because the quantity that previously they were buying, which is this quantity right here from Q star to QS, this quantity is not traded anymore in the market, it's not produced, it's not put for sale. So therefore, these consumers, they will not be able to find anything to buy. Uh, but consumers along the higher parts of the demand, F 
to E, let's say. So these guys in the, in the green segment there, they will be able to buy what they were buying before, but now at the cheaper price because the price before was at P-star and they were having a surplus from P-star up to this green segment where each one was. And then now this uh, surplus will increase much more because the price actually goes down and therefore you have a much higher distance from the P-max up to the green segment of this demand curve. So this policy clearly creates winners and losers. The winners are the people that they are from FE. The losers are those that they are from EA and the producers as well. They are losers. All producers are losers. The consumers, some of them are winners. Some of them are losers. Now, wait a second. Is this good or not? That's what we have to examine because we have some people that they are getting better off. Some other people, they get worse off. Can we do it? If we do it, do we actually have the positivity that comes out of those that they are winners? Does it, does it um, exceed the negativity that comes out from those that they are losers? Okay, we have to examine that. How can we do that? By just checking what happens with efficiency in the market. Let's try to find the surplus. So if the price is P max, a quantity QS will be traded into the market. The quantity from QS to Q star will not be traded anymore. And therefore, from the very beginning, you see that since this is not going to be in the market anymore, the surplus that is, uh, is for this particular quantity will not be distributed. So from the beginning, you can understand here, since quantity is cut down from Q star to QS, you see there that L and N will be a dead weight loss. That's just to train your eye to see things very quickly. So this little triangle there, L and N, these little two triangles, or a triangle E, C, A, if you take it with the letters that they are around it, then you will see that this is a dead weight loss. All right. Now, let me check what happens with the consumer surplus. The consumer surplus was K and L before because price was P star. And now that the price goes down to P max, uh, consumers lose L, but they get M. So the consumer surplus now becomes K plus M. So what actually happens is that the consumers gain M minus L. And seems here that M is bigger than L. So seems that the efficiency on the part of the consumers has improved a little bit because even though you have a dead weight loss, now the consumers are getting the area M, which is bigger. However, this is not always the case. If demand is sufficiently more inelastic than supply, in other words, if the two curves are one flatter, one more vertical, and you can do this at home, you can experiment by just drawing curves in a paper, and you can make, actually, you can achieve that the L area will exceed the area M. So you can actually have that the loss, even for the consumers, is bigger than the benefit to the consumers. Let's see what happens with the producers. The producer surplus was M plus N plus R because price was at P star. Now price is at P max, so the poor producers, they will just get R and that's all. So they are losing M and N. We have already seen that M goes to the consumers and N goes to the deadweight loss. So the gain for the producers is just negative. They lose two areas, M and N. So market efficiency. We have a deadweight loss of L plus N, and this is the cost of this policy. Wait a second. Let's see what happened here. Make sure that we haven't finished yet unless we actually see the whole picture. So the government goes in this market and they says, okay, price is too damn high. All right, what should I do? Let's impose regulation, make it go up to Pmax, no more than that. Why? Because this is the right price, in my opinion. How does this opinion come from? I just thought about it. Okay, so the government doesn't have to tell you how they came up from that. People voted for me. I did what I had to do. If they vote for you, do what you have to do. All right, so the government thought about that. So now that the government believes that P max is the right price, they impose P max. Does the market adapt this price? Yes, it does. So this will be the price in the market, P max. So they achieved 
to make the price lower. However, this didn't come free. Some people were benefit from that. Again, the people that they were in the supply, in the demand curve from F to E, they were benefit from that. The people that they were from E to A and the producers, they lost from that. And then we can see here that we also have a dead weight loss. We also have a cost inefficiency. So regulation is effective, but regulation does not come free, does not come without costs in dead weight loss terms here, and it does not come without side effects, which is that some of the consumers are worse off and all producers are worse off in this particular case. You can have the opposite situation. You can have a price floor, uh, here is a supply and a demand that give you the same equilibrium like before. Now the government comes in and says, ah, the price is pretty damn low. All right. Uh, why do we concern about that? Because usually we, uh, we tend to complain if prices are too high. We never complain if prices are too low. And this is something that you are not very acquainted in, uh, at least in Singapore, because uh, there is no very prominent agricultural production here in Singapore. In my country, that... Uh, production is agricultural, like most of what Greece produces is uh, tourism on the one hand, and then some agricultural production on the other hand, or some specific products that they, uh, they are dealing with, a, uh, with the agricultural production one way or another. And then uh, you have a 25% of the population that they are farmers, and you will see that when you uh, hear the news, you will see that some people complain that the prices are too high in general for, for general consumption goods, but also farmers, they complain that prices are too low and they work all day and then they are selling for very low prices for various reasons. Okay, I have a, a video on my channel that uh, some of you, you may have seen in the, uh, in the orientation that we had when we came uh, in, uh, in SMU, but uh, I talk about the prices of agricultural products, why, uh, why I think it's called from the field to the landfill, and it shows why sometimes the Agri the, the agricultural producers, they tend to, to sell uh, fresh fruit directly to the landfill just because the prices are getting too low and that's the only way that they can find in order to react to this kind of market failure. So this was a market failure. I think it's a 15 minute video. If you haven't watched it with your orientation, you can go in your free time, it's totally optional, and you can watch it. All right, so uh, price is too low here. So what will happen? Uh, government will come in and uh, because you know the farmers are many and means that they are voting also so we have to keep them satisfied because elections will come uh, sooner or later plus they are right because they work all day and the prices are too low and some of them they cannot even have a, a decent standard of living with how low the prices are in some cases all right so the government will come in and say okay i don't like this price i'm going to legislate a higher price so now you have a minimum price, which in order to make sense, it has to be above the equilibrium price. Once this price is imposed, the quantity supplied will become QS, the quantity demanded will become QD. This means that producers get excited from that. They say, okay, if the price is higher, I can actually produce more because why not? I'll make more money. That's what I wanted from the beginning. Our consumers, on the other hand, they're like, oh, now this is too expensive, so I will demand a lower quantity because of that. So you have now the opposite of what happened before. Now you have a surplus, so the production exceeds the demand, and producers will sell a smaller quantity, but now at a higher price. So again, the quantity that will be transacted in this market will be QD now, because QS is supplied, but at that price that is legislated, P mean, only QD will be actually bought. So they will, the market will not clear in the end. There will be surplus finally. Nobody will buy the excess quantity from QS to QD. So consumers along the area CA can no longer buy not because there is no product, but because the price now is too high for those particular consumers. Uh, on the other hand, consumers on FC, uh, they buy, but now they have a much smaller surplus because price has risen from P star to P mean. And the policy again creates winners and losers. 
Let's see what happens with efficiency. At P mean only the quantity QD will be traded because consumers do not want to buy anything more than that at the price P mean. So the consumer surplus that before was R, K, L. Now it will be only R, okay? Because price went up, so the triangle of the consumer surplus became much smaller. So you have a gain for the consumers that is just the loss of two areas, minus K and minus L. K will go, as you suspect, to the producers. And then L will be the dead weight loss together with N, just because QD to Q star will not be transacted again. Let's see what happens with the producers now. The producer surplus was M plus N. Now it becomes M plus K. As you can see here, they lost N, but they gained K. So the gain is K minus N. You can see here that um, K is kind of bigger than N. It's not very clear in this particular graph, but I think that K is bigger than N. But if you change the slopes of the demand and the supply curve, you will see that it's possible that what the producers are losing, the area N, compared to what they are gaining, the area K, it might be the case that they will lose from that. So if demand is sufficiently more elastic than supply, N can exceed K. So in this case, the regulation will be a failure. So with respect to market efficiency, again, you have a deadweight loss of L plus N. L is lost from the consumers, nobody gains. N is lost from the producers, again, nobody gains. But what actually happened here and what mattered in this regulation in terms of efficiency is that area K that before belonged to the consumers, now it is transferred to the producers. So the whole thing happens. So the transfer of area K will uh, actually be completed here. All right, so the efficiency of a competitive market in general in, uh, in the analysis of market, we often talk about the economic efficiency. This is the maximization of the aggregate consumer and producer surplus. We saw that if you leave the market alone and there is no other impediments in most of the perfectly competitive markets, we have no problem getting an equilibrium. When I say most, 99.99% of them, you will see that you have no problem into uh, getting the equilibrium there, and this will give you the maximum efficiency. So policies as uh, price controls, that you don't like the price and you try to increase it or you try to decrease it. So in this case, you may achieve to change the price, but you may impose losses to the economy. First of all, you lose efficiency, then you actually make this, the surpluses of uh, the consumers or the producer to change and you impose the market to a deadweight law. So again, regulation can fix something, but also will come at the cost that the cost will be in terms of deadweight loss and transfer of efficiency from the loser towards the winner. So intervention again will fix the failure, but this will come at an efficiency cost to the economy. So let's see what happens with price regulation when there exists market power. This is one of the most difficult parts of the material. Students find it difficult to follow this analysis, but actually what happens here is a normal monopoly that you already know how it works perfectly, I guess. So it's a very easy uh, uh, method to just follow from the beginning to, to the end and derive what is going to happen in a normal monopoly. If you don't know that, go back to lecture four and refresh your memory. But once you know how a monopoly works, all this simple methodology that we follow, there are just a couple of different things, just a couple of things that I will point out and red flag here. And once you understand those two differences, you will be able to follow the whole logic without a lot of difficulty. So there are some students that they find extremely easy. There are some other students that they don't understand it just because they think that is a whole new process, but it's not a whole new process. It's just a normal monopoly with a couple of small modifications that I will show you right here. So let's get started. Let me bring in the cost structure. This is my marginal cost. This is my average cost. 
and it's a little uh, distorted here. It looks like I took the normal Greek psi uh, core structure and I, I stretched it like that somehow. And uh, this is not because I was lazy to just draw the graph normally. It's because on the right hand of this graph, after the minimum AC, a lot of things will happen. So I wanted to maximize my real estate from that side so you will be able to see clearer what happens in this graph. This is kind of a difficult graph to, to see, and it's a little complicated, but once you will be able to realize what happens to all those systems, you will be pretty fine and that's not pretty hard. So this is my demand, the whole system, demand and marginal revenue. And automatically when I have a demand system and a cost system, my eye automatically searches to find the MR equals MC because I know that this monopoly will go to that point right here. And this will be the marginal revenue equal marginal cost at A prime. I reflect this up to the demand curve which yields equilibrium price PM and equilibrium quantity QM. Now, this price will be high because monopoly. And also there will be a dead weight loss. So we have a dead weight loss of A, A prime C, this uh, kind of triangle there. It's not exactly triangle here because my MC curve is a, is a curve, it's not a straight line, but it's this shape that looks uh, a little bit like a triangle. And uh, this is pretty high. So the regulator looks at that. It says, okay, in perfectly competitive markets, I start regulating a market from a perfect equilibrium where there is no dead weight loss. Now there exists a dead weight loss. If I intervene in this market, am I going to make the dead weight loss smaller or bigger? All right, so we have the first question to answer. Another thing that we can observe in this graph by looking straight away is that the best point of this graph is point C, clearly, for the efficiency in the market, because if you price at a price that is the same height as point C, you will eliminate the dead weight loss completely because this will be the perfectly competitive solution of the market, which is when demand is equal to the marginal cost, because the marginal cost, if it is a perfectly competitive market, counts as the supply curve. So you have demand equal supply, meaning maximum efficiency. Now, this regulator will be a smart regulator and will be like, okay, I see that point C is the best there, but let me start slow. If I start slow and it works, then in the next slide, I'm gonna go a little harder on it and I will try to do even better. So let me impose a price P1 not down to C, but let me see if what I'm doing actually working. So I have two gains as a regulator from this. The first gain is that I lower the price. And also, if this works, I will make the monopolies to produce a little more, which means that consumers will enjoy a little bit more of a product at a lower price. Plus, as I can see now in this graph, the dead weight loss, if I make it, and price goes down to P1 and quantity increases to Q1, then the dead weight loss will become uh, B, B prime C, this little yellow uh, triangle there, which is much smaller than the triangle A, C, A prime. So I have three benefits. Lowering the price, I increase quantity, I decrease the dead weight loss. But let's see if this is going to work. And this is the tricky part. I'm giving a price P1 to this monopolist. Now, this doesn't mean that the monopolist has to go ahead and produce quantity Q1. He will produce quantity Q1 if and only if this is the best given that the price now is P1. Maybe this monopolist will say, no, I will not produce Q1. I will produce QM or even I will produce less than QM. Q is free to be set by the monopolist. What the regulator does here tells this monopolist with legislation, with a bill, that you cannot charge a price above P1. It's easy to understand that this monopolist wanted to price above P1 without the regulation, so the best he can do now is charge P1. So we should not reasonably expect that this monopolist now will want to charge anything below P1. 
But at price P1, does he want to produce Q1? Well, he will do if and only if he maximizes his profit there. Now, I fail to see at price P1 what happens with MC and MR. However, the first difficult point, the first red flag, goes here to the fact that this marginal revenue curve is produced by the demand curve in a very simple way that you should know by heart so far, by taking the demand, keeping the same intercept, doubling the slope, and you take the marginal revenue curve. But this means that my marginal revenue curve corresponds to this demand curve. The problem with this demand curve is that now above P1, it doesn't apply. In other words, if I want to price any quantity from zero up to Q1, I'm not saying that this guy will produce Q1, but if he wants to price any quantity from zero up to Q1, the demand curve shows him prices that they exceed the regulation level. So this guy cannot go there. So the demand curve above point B, which corresponds to quantities from zero to Q1, is actually useless. So I have to figure out since this part of the demand doesn't work, let me make it red so you will know that this doesn't work anymore. So this part does not apply anymore. So what happens here is that since this doesn't apply, then this means that the marginal revenue from zero to Q1 is not right because this marginal revenue from zero to Q1 corresponds to the red part of the demand curve and therefore should not apply either. Now, what happens is that for quantity zero to Q1, the monopolist actually becomes a price taker. It's not a perfectly competitive market, but somebody is giving the monopolist the price and be like, okay, this is the price. If you want, follow it. If you don't want, you can charge below that. And the monopolist will be, no, thank you. I don't want to charge below. I want to charge exactly P1. So for any quantity between zero and Q1, this monopolist becomes a price taker and the price is given to the monopolist from the regulator to be P1. So this means that if you are a price taker, your marginal revenue will be equal to the price that you will be given because for the first unit, you will get what? P1. For the second unit, you will get what? Again, P1. For the fifth unit, you will get what? P1. For any unit up to Q1, we'll be getting P1. So your marginal revenue will be a horizontal curve from point E to point B, which is this purple curve right here. All right, so this means that my marginal revenue will be kind of similar to a perfectly competitive situation at the price that my regulator gives me. But then for any quantity I want to price above Q1 now, I can actually use my normal demand curve because any quantity above Q1 corresponds to this part of the demand curve. And this part of the demand curve corresponds to prices that they are below the regulation level. So if you want to price a quantity Q1 plus 100, let's say here, then you are not touched by the regulation because the best price will be to go somewhere here, which the regulation doesn't bother you anyways. So from quantity zero to Q1, my marginal revenue is this flat horizontal EB segment. And from any quantity above Q1, so I will jump down here to the old marginal revenue up to point F, and then I will continue along my old marginal revenue curve. So we have this broken kind of marginal revenue curve, which reminds us a little bit what happened to the King demand model that we had in the tutorial video five. So this is pretty much the same logic here. So we have a situation where the marginal revenue is the curve E, B, F, and then continues up, down up to the MR designation here in this graph. So this is my MR. So now that I have the correct MR 
with the regulation, this is the purple curve is the MR with regulation that price cannot exceed P1. So once I have my regulation marginal revenue, I will put it here in this graph and I will see that MR equals MC happens at B prime. At B prime, I want to uh, reflect this up to the demand curve. And this is at point B where I can go because it's exactly at the point that my demand curve starts working again. So this means that indeed, when you, I have regulation at P1, the quantity that maximizes my profit where MR under the regulation is equal to MC is Q1. So indeed, this regulation will be successful. Indeed, the monopolist for price P1 will want to produce quantity Q1, which will lower the price, increase the quantity, and limit the dead weight loss to the little yellow triangle. So indeed, this regulation is successful because the, we will go to point uh, B, and this is much closer to C than A that we were before was. All right. So the regulator sees that this works and now says, I'm going to go all the way and I will actually try to make it so the dead weight loss will disappear. How can you do that? So in this case, you can target a regulation that will be exactly at this point here. So you will have to cause price to fall to the perfectly competitive level, which I designate with PC here. This will make you produce a quantity again at point C that will be QC now, the competitive quantity. And now to eliminate the dead weight loss entirely because the perfectly competitive firms do not have a dead weight loss. So the marginal curve with regulation is not difficult to find according to the previous logic again. So now it will be very easy. For any point between zero and QC, I cannot go to my original demand curve because my original curve is above the regulation level. So I read it out, so I will not going to confuse it. This means that from zero quantity up to QC quantity, I'm a price taker again. Now the price I'm taking is PC, according to the regulation, which makes my marginal revenue for quantities between zero and QC to be the flat horizontal segment BC, this uh, greenish color there. And then I jump down to my old marginal revenue curve because for any quantity above QC, my demand curve has no problem, is below the regulatory level. And therefore I will be allowed to use this part of the marginal revenue also. So my marginal revenue curve is BCE and goes down up to the MR. And then if I want to find the point where MR is equal to MC, this happens at point C. And this means that indeed price goes down, quantity increases to the competitive level, and I eliminate the dead weight loss entirely. So again, this regulation is successful. So we see here that with correct regulation, when you know what you're doing, you can actually take a market which is inefficient, and then fix it. So, regulation in perfectly competitive markets fixes something, messes up something else. Regulation in monopoly markets, it will take the dead weight loss, and if it happens correctly, it will reduce it or even eliminate it. So the only loser that we have in this market is the monopolist. Now, from terms of fairness, I'm not a philosopher, but I think that, okay, you are messing up the uh, satisfaction of one person because this one person makes uh, less billions and then you increase the welfare of everybody else. That sounds like kind of a good thing to me unless you look at like voting rights and then you say, okay, so all the people that have a lot of votes, so I want to be on the right side of, of the people. And then this monopolist is just one vote. I don't care that much for him. So I will regulate this monopoly. Unless, like it happens very often, this monopolist is actually uh, coming to my fundraisers for my party and he's uh, my political party. And uh, he's contributing a lot of money. So in this case, maybe 
I have to find the balance between satisfying the voters and satisfying also the uh, need of the monopolies, the natural need that the monopolies have for billions. So this is something that it's some food for thought and see how this process might work to begin with. But there is also another problem here. Uh, you might have a regulator that doesn't know what he's doing. So he went to point C before and he has done everything, works perfectly. And now he says, hmm, this actually, what I'm doing works. What if I try to make it work even better? So here's what I, I'm going to do. I'm going to impose a regulation at P2 now. P2 will be even lower than the perfectly competitive price. All right, perfectly competitive price is at the height of C in this graph. Now we'll go even lower. Why am I gonna do that? Because if I do that, I will increase the quantity even more. So my quantity will go somewhere here and I will increase the quantity a lot. I will decrease the price a lot. And this will actually make these uh, monopolies to just work and produce as much as possible at the point that just breaks even, doesn't make losses, but doesn't make any profits either. So I don't like these guys to make billions. I'm going to force them to price at a level that they will just break even their costs when they, they produce. Okay, so why should these monopolists make like a billion every day, like Bezos, for example, and um, not make just a normal salary every day? Will this work? Okay, let's try this. Now I know uh, if I want to go to a point like uh, the point Q2 there, this will be at point B, quantity Q2. So now I know that for any quantity from zero up to Q2, my demand gives me higher prices than the regulation, so I cannot go there. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to have my marginal revenue to be from, from P2 up to point B right there then it will jump down to the original marginal revenue, which is not much remaining there because most of it I have regulated. And it will be this uh, fuchsia color uh, marginal revenue curve. Now I have to see where MR is equal to MC. It should be at point, this is the MC. And as I come right here, so this is the point where MR is equal to MC. This point is point B prime and actually doesn't correspond to quantity Q2 that I wanted to impose in this market, corresponds to quantity Q prime 2, which is much lower than Q2 and is actually much lower than QC, which is, will be at this level right here. All right, so you see here that you failed. Actually, by lowering the regulation price even more, you went back to a situation that you don't even uh, produce as much as under regulation at PC that we had in the slide before. So now you totally messed up things. This doesn't work at all. So what actually happens is that this monopoly says, if I go to point B, indeed I produce much more, but my, uh, my production will be where AC is equal to my price and therefore I will make zero profit for each unit I'm producing. So I'm not going to make any profit is if I go to B. But if I got down production a lot, then I will go to, since I'm in this economies of scale situation here, I'm going to go earlier in my cost curve where my cost is still lower. I'm going to keep this price at B prime, this price P2 allows me to make some profit. So the maximum profit is at B prime, which is at quantity Q prime two, which is lower than Q2 and lower than QC that we would have here at the same uh, height as point C is on the uh, horizontal axis. So regulation is unsuccessful. It limits quantity to a quantity lower than even the perfectly competitive quantity and maintains a significant dead weight loss, KCB prime. So actually this way the regulator has overshooted and took what he had built in the previous two slides and actually destroyed it. So you cannot just become trigger happy with regulation and keep going and going and going. There are even some limits to the regulation. Again, to recap, 
Regulation, if it's applied in perfectly competitive markets, maybe will fix some things, but will mess up some other things. If it's applied in monopoly, it can actually make the monopolist worse off, but the efficiency in the market can be improved a lot up to the point that efficiency will become maximum and the dead weight loss will be completely eliminated. However, this means that still there exists some point after which if you keep regulating, you are going to destroy this result and inefficiencies will come back and become bigger and bigger. So as you try to lower the price even lower than P2, you will see that your dead weight loss might become even bigger than the normal monopoly. And this is something that has happened repeatedly in situations where uh, command economies, they tried to regulate the production of goods and they totally made everybody to not want to work in this particular uh, production uh, factories. And therefore you saw that uh, there was problems and they had to roll back regulation that was working by overshooting to prices that could not be achieved. And remember what I told you before, that we have a box of reality and you cannot go outside of the box. Here's another situation. Like this guy, when he, he says that uh, it's not enough to go to PC, I want to go down to P2, he does what? He doesn't respect the box. Okay, he wants to go outside of the box, to do something better than what the economy as a, a functioning organism can actually give you. So this would be outside of the feasibility of common logic to do it. And economics is nothing more than common logic. Like everything that we explain here follows some logical steps. And that's exactly what we're doing. And recap number two, nothing hard happens in this particular situation. The only thing that you have to be concerned here, and it's something that you just looking at this graph, this looks like a mess. This looks like you took a plate of spaghetti and you threw it on the floor. That's how all, all the curves look like. Or even worse than that, how my, 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 my headphones come out of my pocket every time that, that they, they are entangled like so much that, that it takes me like five minutes to, to, to take them apart. So this is exactly the situation that happens here. But if your eyes are trained, you can see just a couple of things. So you have a demand system and a cost system. You are done with the curves. And then you say, okay, so what happens? We have, this is the maximum price. So I will take a red pencil and I will cancel out the part of the demand, which is up to point B, so I'm not going to be confused and go there because the regulation doesn't allow me to go there. So we have this problem there. So since I'm a price taker, now I know that because I watched the video carefully, now I know that from anything up to when the regulator touches, crosses the demand curve, you always find this point and you say, okay, up to this point, now I have a regulation and I cannot price wherever I want. So I have to price up to the regulation. So what am I? A price taker. What MR price takers have? Flat horizontal curves. So from here, this is my MR. And then I jump down to my old MR. And then I'm doing what? What I was doing before. I'm trying to look where MR is equal to MC. So here MR is equal to MC at this point right here. This is my quantity. I will just get this price. I'm also already given the price at that part of the curve. Done. So it's not just learning a whole, a, a whole new logic here. It's just the old logic with one modification. So do not think that because some students, what they do is that like, oh my God, what the hell happens in this graph? This is horrible. I, I'm, I'm never going to learn that. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We start from knowing the monopoly and then we follow the logic of the monopoly till the point that the regulation does not allow us to go where we want to go as a monopoly. And then we start behaving in the way that the monopolist is allowed to by just taking this modification that we will go now and become price takers and blah, blah, blah. And we start having that. So it's not hard. 
you have to follow it because even you will never become a regulator or something like that. This is a notion that I want your brain to be able to handle problems like that. This is not difficult. This is an intellectuality level that is as you are assumed to be very comfortable with, very comfortable with. Okay, it's not hard at all. Now you have how this should be explained. By the way, this is maybe the sixth take in order to explain these three slides like that. I'm, I'm just now trying to explain them for more than one hour. Okay, so now you have the way that you should see that. And once you see that in this way, it will be very easy for you to take the pieces of the puzzle that you already know those pieces and put them together in this way. So you already know monopoly, you already know price taking, you just put them together where you should, since the difference is now the regulation, and you come up with a solution of the problem. Nothing too peculiar or too difficult here. All right, so let's now jump to what we call the natural monopoly. A natural monopoly is a normal monopoly that is a little peculiar. It has one more peculiarity. Once you know the peculiarity, everything else works just as we have seen already. So in some markets, it is possible that a single firm, just one firm, when you have a monopolist, in other words, the output can be produced at a significantly lower cost than if there were several firms. So there are some particular industries that you do not want to have competition. Why? Because having the product being produced by many different producers, the cost goes up. Why the cost goes up? And usually when I talk about costs, unless I specify specifically in this particular sentence what I'm talking about, I usually talk about the per unit cost, okay? So why does this happen? Because of two reasons. First of all, economies of scale. And second reason is that the market is not big enough to allow us to reach the economies of scale for more than one firm. So the demand is not as big as it would allow me to make it to the, uh, to the minimum cost by allowing more than one firm to produce. Let's see that. So when there are large economies of scale, my cost curves would look like that. A lot of students, they see that and they say, oh, that's not your normal Greek Psi looking cost system. Actually, it is. The problem is that my slide is small and I wanted to make these economies of scale to be very intense. So what happens is that this will keep going down and then, then I'm going out of frame from this side and what happens there is that this continues and will go back up and then the marginal cost will catch up and will cut it from below to the minimum and it will become like a Greek Psi, but this will happen like down there in the, in the street in the other building. So very big economies of scale. So now if I have to split this monopoly into two firms, the result will be that the average cost will be higher. So if you want to produce 2 billion widgets, then if you have just one firm that has this cost, cost per unit is 10. So this means that since you're producing two units, your total cost of dealing with this production will be 20, 10 for the first unit, because this is cost per unit, plus 10 for the other unit. So you have a total cost of 20. Now, another idea is to share this production into two different firms. If you share it, let's say equally, one firm will produce one unit, the other firm will produce the second unit. All right, so you one unit each. This means that since the two firms will have exactly the same technology, technology, they, will, they are not gonna be technologically advanced just because they split, right? We should not expect that. So since the technology will be exactly the same, so if you go to the same technology to the uh, one unit, you will see that the unit cost now is 15, meaning that you will have to produce one unit in one firm will be 15, and another unit in another firm, again 15, because now you cannot go and produce two units in one firm that will bring you here. You will, you will replicate this 
exact thing for two times now, one for each firm. And then the unit cost is 15. Since you produce again two units, the cost of two units will be 30. So you see here that you have an increase 50% to the cost. Now, in some cases, this can actually be, this curve can be asymptotically increasing to infinity like that. So you might have like much bigger differences. And we have a lot of examples like that. Like for example, metro, airports, and utilities. Imagine if, for example, if I want to fly from um, Singapore and I go to Tokyo, there are at least three, four flights that they compete with each other. I mean, right now there's no flights at all, but in normal times, if they ever come again, there will be flights. So, I hope so. So, you will have some competition going on there. But if I want to go from here, the university, I want to go, let's say, to uh, down to the marina, I can take the metro to go there, and there is only one metro. There is no more than one competing metro. Like, are you going to go with metro A or metro B or the company C or the company D? Like, for example, with the airlines that I can go wherever I want. Why is that? Because making a, a metro has so big fixed costs that the economies of scale that they come out of this cost, they, they will apply only if the cost is actually distributed among millions of, of units of the product, many, millions of uh, transportation trips from one place to another. If I have four, five different companies that they do that, the it will be very difficult for them to actually be able to cover all these huge fixed costs. Same happens with airports. We talked about this again. We have the big cities, not the mega cities, but the big cities, they usually have one airport. Above 10 million population, it's when you start seeing something like a second airport. And when you have above 15 million because of the uh, big diseconomies of scale that you have after some point, you might see even three airports, for example, like Moscow or like London or many some, some other cities that they have more than one. But if the demand is actually at some point where you cannot cover the cost of more than one firm, then in this case, you have something that is called a natural monopoly. Now, a natural monopoly usually will be heavily regulated because it's a monopoly that we are forced to have. And usually, in some cases, the governments either own this monopoly, so they set the pricing, or they can actually heavily regulate this monopoly. So how do they re regulate it? Let's bring in a demand system here to see what we are talking about. Uh, this monopolist, if it's left alone, he will be pricing at PM, which is a price that's pretty high and uh, brings the quantity down, restricts the quantity to QM. Now, since the government will heavily regulate those, and in most countries, no matter how free an economy is, you will see regulation for natural, for natural monopolies, you will see here that there are two ways to regulate that. The first way is to regulate for efficiency and will drop the price to point E, to the height of point E, PE right here, and we'll go for the maximum quantity that can be produced in this market. In other words, the maximum efficiency. When is the maximum efficiency? When the perfectly competitive quantity is uh, produced in the market. When do you produce the perfectly competitive quantity? When your price becomes equal to MC? This is exactly what happens at point E. Price from the demand curve and MC become equal there. So this is the point where you have zero dead weight loss and maximum quantity produced. If you observe here, because of the economies of scale and because my MC has not still catched up with AC, what actually happens is that my MC is below my AC, which means that at the price PE, Producing a quantity QE will make me to have losses. Why is that? Because at quantity QE, your cost is above at this point right here. So you have losses that they are at this area. So yes, you do have 
a low price. Yes, you do not have a dead weight loss. Yes, you have the maximum quantity if this is, for example, the metro, or if this is a public utility company like the electricity company or the water company or uh, whatever other companies the, the governments usually own or control. So if this is that, then yes, you have like the cheapest electricity or the cheapest metro and your metro will be used a lot and your consumers will be using it because it's cheap and you will have less traffic and consumers will be happy with you because you provide good quality transportation through the metro and all this. But this public company or this natural monopoly will have a substantial amount of losses every year. And these losses have to be covered. How can they be covered? Sometimes they're covered from the, from the budget. So the government, in the end of the year, they will have to subsidize these natural monopolies in order to be able to keep functioning because you cannot keep operating with losses forever. After some point, you will, you will not be able to pay everybody around you, so you will, you will need some trans transfusion of cash in order to be able to survive. So this cash will come from funding from the government by subsidizing this particular natural monopoly. Now, in some economies, people don't like that. They okay. So if you have a metro, let's say, in uh, Berlin, why I, that I live in uh, Dresden, that I don't have a metro, should I pay taxes? And I never use the metro because I'm not in Berlin. And these are cities in Germany, by the way. And therefore, I will pay from Dresden. I will pay for the people in Berlin that they use their metro every day and they go fancy while I'm taking the bus and I'm going to work like that every day. Okay, so I, I don't like that. So in some cases, we might not like that. So this kind of efficiency regulation will not be acceptable. People do not like this cost. They don't like the fact that they have losses. Okay, so therefore, there is an alternative here, which is pricing for sustainability. So PS will be the level that will be at the height of point S here. Point S is when my price given from demand is equal to AC. If you go to S, then the monopoly will produce a smaller quantity QS, but you will be at the zero profit sustainable level from now on, meaning that you just make exactly as much as you spend so you can sustain this natural monopoly forever. So, two schools of regulation here. Regulation for efficiency at point E, regulation for sustainability at point S. Both of them, they have pluses and minuses. Like for example, Europeans, they most of the times will go for efficiency regulation for natural monopolies, meaning that they will prefer to subsidize the natural monopolies and they will have to produce a lot. So for example, people in Berlin say, okay, I understand that people from Dresden, they have to pay for the Berlin uh, metro, but actually the clean air that results from using the metro instead of all of these uh, Berlin people to take their cars will actually be something that will affect the atmosphere. We have cleaner air in Germany and everybody will benefit from that. So, and also we will have another natural monopoly in Dresden, let's say, and we will subsidize that too. So people from Berlin will actually pay for this and vice versa, because you cannot take the money from taxpayers and put them in separate bins. Actually, with the local governments, you can kind of do that, but you know, governments are always the government and things are never clear. And sometimes they, um, you have also corruption and you have huge inefficiency in how the mechanism of governments works. So these are general principles. So Europe will go for this. United States, they just get sick of this. If you tell an American that they have to use their tax dollars for helping somebody else, they don't like that. They were like, okay, this is a free handout. I don't like that, that's not in my culture. I'm not saying that this is a bad view of things. I'm saying that this, there is a different mentality. Okay, so 
In United States, you will see regulation that is for sustainability. In Europe, you will see regulation that is for efficiency. In um, other countries, like for example, in Asia, uh, for example, in China, we will see that most of the times the natural monopolies will be, uh, will be pressed to produce quantities that they are even at the point, like uh, in the previous slide that we had this overshooting, they will say, okay, you are going to produce at P2, but also you are going to produce quantity Q2. So they go even for points that they are above the level of the, uh, of the demand in this case. So you might have uh, some cases if you have an economy that acts as a command economy in this particular case, you may have a regulation that is even lower than efficiency, but in this case you have to not let the market, the economics work at all. You just go to the head of the factory and you say, listen, this is the price and this is how much you produce. And if you have any other questions, come and ask me. Okay, you don't let any free choice happening here because the box that I told you before happens in economies that there is a little bit of freedom. Now, in some economies, there are some particular segments in the economy that there is no freedom. And you say, okay, you're a government company, you're producing at that price and that much, and end of story, there's no economics involved there. It's just an order. You just take it and follow it like in the army. Okay, so you have to have this in mind that in some cases you may have a regulation that is not actually a regulation in the sense that I limit something in order to give you an incentive to do something else, it doesn't work like that. In this case, we have like, okay, this is your price, this is your quantity, deal with it, work with it. It's your own problem from now on. All right, so let's go to the next segment for today, which is antitrust. And antitrust is super interesting. It will become uh, very, very uh, uh, recent now with respect to the news because it's the next hot topic that you will see a lot of politics in the world shifting around antitrust because antitrust is actually a mechanism of, uh, of altering the economic results, which uh, now a lot of economies realize that they did not use for a long time at least to the degree that they could, and a lot of different interests have uh, grown very much and they're about to go back and bite them. Like for example, we have seen from the previous cycle of elections in the United States, that they had some huge problems with monopolies, that they, uh, these monopolies, they even decided or affected significantly the results of the election. So each party for their own reasons, they have, targeted particular parts, particular uh, sides of the, of the big tech, of the big companies, of the monopolies, of the huge corporations, and they want to put them back in order because you see that we have these situations to grow a lot. So antitrust, here we have to do with abuse of dominant position. So you have a company that has a dominant position in the market for some reason, and then they take this position and they abuse it. Now, just having market power is not an abuse. You may have market power for many reasons. The simpler uh, reason is because you are the best. Like for example, you have a hawker center, everybody makes chicken and rice, everybody makes good chicken and rice, but there is this one guy that makes amazing chicken and rice. And this guy will have a line outside of the, of the stall and will also have uh, the ability to increase price. Is this monopoly power? Yes, it is. Is it fair? Again, yes, it is. So having monopoly power is not bad. The thing is, the problem is when you have market power because you have done some things that they are not like, just being better. You're not uh, better than others. You just found some way to limit others, to throw out others outside of the market. And that's why you have a market power. Okay, so it's good to have market power because your chicken and rice is the best. It's bad to have market power because you bought all the chicken stores around the area and you are not selling any chicken to anybody else who wants to make chicken and rice. And now people will get only from you. So if you make it the best, then this means that fair 
market power. If you made the other way, then this means that, again, market power, but now when fair. So here we're talking for two things. First of all, having market power, and second, abusing market power, because all these are pretty vague, and now we start putting them in order to try to understand what actually happens. So using market power to eliminate, restrict, or distort the competition is a concern. So authorities will intervene to control the firm conduct uh, whenever there is an abuse. And uh, you may have, for example, excessive prices, which brings me to the classic example for this is uh, this guy right here. Uh, some people know him just as the most hated person in the world. Uh, his name is Martin Shkreli. And uh, he's a guy that um, nobody knew about him, but he wanted to become very renowned. And uh, he couldn't find any better way. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy a pharmaceutical company that produces a, one medication, has a monopoly in one particular medication that very sick people are taking. So this medication uh, was called Deraprim and is the medication for toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is a very rare disease in the kidneys. It's very serious. And it happens most prominently among uh, uh, patients that they have uh, HIV, the HIV vi virus. And sometimes it's the main reason of, for dying from, from, from AIDS. So Screlly bought the company that produces Deraprim. And the first night that he had the company, he decided to increase the price of Deraprim a little bit. So he increased it from, I think it was $6 per pill before, which $6 per pill is not very cheap in general. It's a, it's a price that is considered to be, if, if it's $6 every day, imagine how it is in 30 days or in a year of therapy that you need Deraprim. Uh, but he said, that's not enough. So what I'm going to, to take the price to is $650 from $6 which is something that, as you understand, uh, made the headlines. Okay, now uh, this guy uh, did nothing really illegal. So he went to the news and he actually went to this um, really, what adjective can I use for his smile? So he went with this smile in the news, I think he was in CNN, and he said, listen, it's my company, we have a free economy, I do whatever I want. And people started asking, but yeah, these are patients. Like, don't worry about the patients, the insurance companies are paying. But there are many patients that they do not pay with insurance companies, they do not have insurance. Like there are 20 million people in the United States right now that they do not have insurance coverage at all. And most of them, they are people that they have trouble getting insurance just because of the health situation. And actually a very big percentage of HIV carriers, they do not have health insurance and there is a big problem for them getting their medication. And he said, well, it's a free market. That's what I want to do. That's what I do. And as you understand, he made it to become the most hated person in the world. However, he was right. This is a free market. I mean, he was, uh, it was accurate when he said, uh, what he said, uh, it's a free market. You can price as much as, as you want, unless you just find silly excuses, just increase the price when people need you more and you do like price gouging, which there are some regulations against it but setting a high price for something, it's a free economy, you can do that. However, this guy, after a few months, he ended up like that. This is when uh, they take him to jail. Uh, I checked a few months ago, he was still in jail, but I think he was getting out. I think he's about the time that he will become a free person again, but he spent quite some time in jail. I think he went there from 2008 up to like maybe six years, five years, something like that. Like he got like a, a lot of years. Um, uh, in jail. But this was not because uh, he was charging higher prices for Deraprim. Like he became so hated that the prosecutors in New York, they started seeing it as, if I find a way to put this guy in jail, then because the prosecutors are elected, the, uh, the, the state attorney is elected in the United States. So I said like, if I find any way to put this guy in jail, I'm sure to be re-elected again the next term. 
Okay, people who love me so much, like find the reason, like just follow him and find the time that he's gonna spit his chewing gum in the, in the sidewalk and arrest him and be like, this um, is a manslaughter because you know, somebody could step on that and find like a bogus uh, uh, accusation like that and put him in jail. And they indeed, they start looking and looking and looking and they found that truly in the past, he had done some, he had done some uh, fraud with some security, some inside trading or something like that. And they put him in jail for a long time. Like that was something that if you are abusing the power, the authorities will be really interested to see what you are doing. Uh, strategies that they deter entry or expansion of rivals are very concerning for the authorities. Uh, price discrimination or time. Price discrimination is when you charge different prices to different individuals, especially when you are doing this in the supply chain. Like for example, I will be Microsoft and I'm selling my operating system for uh, servers, let's say for $10 in one company, $10 a day and $100 in another company. This actually creates not equal uh, conditions for competition between those two companies. So this might create a problem, price discrimination, if it happens like that. Tying is when you expect from the consumers to buy one product in order to consume another product. This might actually create, like for example, when you say that if you, um, uh, you run Windows in your, in your PC, then you must be using this uh, browser that Microsoft makes. I don't know how they, Edge, how it's called, like, um, which is a browser that is um, uh, very useful, super useful, because once you have a new computer, you have, to, you have to go on Edge and download Chrome, and that's pretty much the whole use of it. All right, so um, you cannot do that. Now they, uh, uh, Microsoft actually had the Internet Explorer, which they had another huge antitrust case with that, and they got a very big fine, uh, um, amazingly high fine back for the 90s for this, for this company. It was uh, something like, the fine was something like, a, uh, I don't remember the number, I remember it was like 10% of the whole value of this super huge company, which is which, a, a very big uh, fine back then. So uh, predatory behavior, this is when you treat your market in a way that uh, you try to kick others outside of the market in order to keep the position for yourself. And then once you kick everybody out, you try to raise barriers of entry and keep the market for yourself. And finally, vertical restraints. And vertical restraints is, again, in the supply, si in the supply chain side. So imagine that you have a manufacturer and this manufacturer actually has several retailers and then sets the price for the retailer. Say, for example, okay, so I am Coca-Cola and I'm selling Coca-Cola through different restaurants and I'm going to these restaurants and I'm saying that, okay, so I will give you this price for Coca-Cola provided that you are selling at that price, that particular price, and also you are not having Pepsi in your, uh, in your store. Okay, so you put a vertical restraint on others and then restaurants, once they compete with each other, they have very different, different terms. And this is not good for competition again. So all these kinds here of, of restrictions, they would be very interesting for the authorities to look into and to try and find which of these ways they violate, uh, uh, they violate competition and they create dominant position. So who is in charge of overlooking how the competition works in a country? There is the antitrust authority. In every country, there is a national authority for trade and antitrust in charge of protecting and promoting healthy competition. Most systems, they use a sequential mixture of rules and discretion. This means that in most systems, what you actually have is there is a, a set of rules that they are not hard rules, they're just some strict guidelines. And the guidelines tell you what you have to do. And once you disobey the, these guidelines, like you go against these guidelines 
sufficiently, then the antitrust authority will step in and they will decide if they will give you a fine or they will prosecute you depending on where you are and what kind of penalties they will ask for you. And uh, it works in two stages. So the first stage is that there is some general regulation, some general rules, and these rules deal with the 90% of the cases. They just obey the rules and there's no problem. And the ones that they do not obey the rules, then the regulator will step in and say, okay, I see that you did not obey the rule, but I understand the reason. Uh, you're free to go. And I see that this other guy uh, actually disobeyed the rules and there is uh, bad intent there. So I will prosecute this case and I will impose a fine and I will take it to the next level, which is punishment. Okay, so you have two levels of the regulation that works here. In case the authority of this country identifies a violation of the rules, then it can propose to settle with a perpetrator with a fine or even jail time. So again, in the United States, there is criminal prosecution for antitrust case, uh, any antitrust case. It has a, a criminal uh, segment, a criminal leg. And then in European Union, there is no criminal case. The cases are all civil. But then in this case, in the European Union, the, the fines are much bigger and much more important. They can alter the result a lot. So. In general, uh, in the United States, or when you have a, a, a situation where the national authority is not a statutory body, and you will see what I mean a little later in a couple of slides, what exactly we mean, then uh, it can go directly to the perpetrator and be like, okay, listen, uh, you don't have a case here. You just uh, disobeyed the regulation. You did it with a very bad intent. I can prove that in court. If you want to save yourself some fines and some uh, uh, attorney expenses, then uh, we can settle to this fine, just uh, uh, roll back this policy, don't do that again, or do not merge with this guy and stuff like that. So this is the first step to, uh, to propose to settle with a perpetrator with a fine or even jail time. Uh, and then if this doesn't work, it can take the case uh, to normal, uh, to the normal judicial system in every country, and they will try the case there in front of a normal judge. There's nothing very specific. Um, this here, is the case that happens in almost 90% uh, of the countries. Okay, 90% of the countries, they will proceed like that. There are some countries that they don't do it exactly like that. They have some significant differences. This is what happens in the 90% of the world, and Singapore is not in that 90% of the world. It's in the 10%. It does something else, which I will show you also very precisely what the differences are, and you will understand why I make a big deal about it. Now, in general, the judicial system, and this will apply also in Singapore a little bit, so in order to have a, a situation that will go to court, you should have a defendant, so the defendant will be lawyered up and ready to go to trial because he's accused, so the prosecutor is the person who accuses him, so you have a relationship between the prosecutor wants to take the perpetrator and take them to jail or take them to pay the fine or to stop doing this policy that uh, hinders trade or creates problems to competition. And then uh, the, the defendant has, of course, a right to defend themselves. There is a judge who is going to precede this case. In most countries, the judge will not be the one who will decide you will have a body of jurors that they will come together, simple people, and they will, the judge will just make sure that everything follows the legal procedures, and then the jurors will make the decision if the case has merit, if the defendant is guilty or the defendant is not guilty. All right, so this is the whole thing that happens here. That's a crash course of how the judicial system works in countries that they use jurors. In many countries, the antitrust cases, they will go only to judges because they need specialized knowledge. In some other countries, like for example, in the United States, uh, they will go to jurors, will make, which makes it much better for the companies because jurors sometimes do not understand very well what's going on and they can buy the argument of the companies even though the, the policy was really monopolistic. And uh, in general, this is what you should expect. All right, so there is something very important that you have to understand in order to be able to uh, go with the analysis. So in general, in every case, the prosecution carries the burden of proof. So the prosecution 
is the one who must prove if the defendant is guilty or not guilty. Okay, so the, the prosecution takes the defendant to court because they believe that they are guilty. But they have to prove that they are, they are guilty. So this is a principle that outside of this might be useful for you in many, many things. Because I see a lot of, a lot of people and I had um, a lot of customers when I was teaching uh, public speaking and uh, PR. And um, I had a lot of customers that they, my clients, they had a problem understanding uh, the burden of proof and they would actually fall into traps all the time, especially politicians do that. So the thing is that if somebody accuses you for something, you do not have a duty to prove that what they accuse you of is wrong. Actually, the reverse, the accuser must prove that what they say stands. Like, for example, somebody can walk into the room and say, Cosmos, you're an elephant. And I will be like, no, I'm not an elephant because first of all, I'm not gray. Second, my ears are not that big. And third, I, um, uh, I do not have a trunk. And uh, fourth, because I am uh, not that fat and start arguing why I'm not an elephant. I was like, okay, why do you say that? Okay, and this happens something like, for example, you have a politician and he presents his, uh, his, his topic and then the, the journalist is like accusing him. Like, yeah, but you did that and it was like that. And then the politician automatically becomes defensive. It's like, oh no, no, actually I didn't do this. I did that and that and that and answer this. If you can answer it very easily, yes, go ahead and say, sir, sorry, I can prove that I'm innocent. I was not there when you accused me that I was because I was here and I have proof of that. End of story, goodbye. But if it's not very easy to, to articulate all these arguments, the best thing you can do is like, oh, you say that I did that. Where do you base that? How do you prove it? Okay, and you make this person to, to everybody to see that this person's argument is actually empty. Same thing happens in court, but in court this has a name, it's called the burden of proof, and then the judge always expects the accusations to be explained from the prosecutor. The prosecutor has to make a case. And that's why if you watch movies, you usually hear that you have the right to remain silent. This is the Miranda right, and actually means that you don't have any duty to defend yourself. You can sit there at the court, not speak at all, and then if the prosecutor cannot prove that you are guilty, you are free to go. You don't have to prove anything. All right, this is very important here, and you will see why. So, the prosecutor must provide evidence, that evidence beyond the reasonable doubt, that the defendant has violated the law. Like, for example, with expert testimony, you call an economics professor who does econometrics and say, okay, did you analyze the data set of the pricing of these two companies? Yes. Can you tell us in your expert opinion that these two companies have actually violated the law by coordinating the prices? Yes, I can see that. I ran these statistical tests and at a 99.9% confidence level, I can tell you that these actions that they took were coordinated. Okay, and then the defendant a lawyer will go and be like, okay, sir, this model that you applied, how many other professors agree with that? Have you seen the paper of that professor that actually contests this model and says that this model is only accurate when there is, let's say, no correlation between the prices and the seasonality in the, um, in the economy and things like that, or it should not work when there is a crisis and the economy goes downwards and all these arguments. And then the jurors that they're sitting there, they have to make, okay, who is the one of the two that has a right? So you have to present evidence and then the defense has a right to defend this evidence to say that this evidence is not actually accurate. Uh, another thing is hard evidence. Like for example, here are some pictures. Here is the transcript of some emails. Here is some phone calls. Here is some uh, uh, wiretap of everything that uh, these guys, they were talking. So um, here is the, the rec record. Hey, Johnny, do you want to set the prices? Uh, yes, let's set them. How much do you want to, to sell for? Let's sell for 10. No, no, make it 12. Okay, 12, deal, deal. And then the defense will be like, no, no, they were not talking about these prices. They were talking about something else or something like that. So again, 
this is another kind of evidence. Use of facilitating practices, like the ones that we talked about in the previous lecture and we analyzed, like for example, meeting competition clauses, common ventures, establishing channels of communication and all this can be used as evidence. Evidence that firms acted contrary to their own unilateral self-interest, like for example, by increasing the price when the demand was falling. When the demand was going down because of a crisis, they were increasing the prices. That's very suspicious and probably sells, uh, probably sells the argument that uh, before, the, uh, before the crisis they were not colluding and they decided to collude when the crisis came and they acted contrary to their self-interest of uh, firms usually want to decrease their prices when there is a crisis coming because there is the income effect in the demand. Customers do not have so much income anymore, so they will decrease their demand. You have to lower your prices if you want to keep maximizing your profit. Now, how can you defend these kind of accusations if you are a defendant? Today, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know in order to become like um, uh, to become good in evading the antitrust. Okay, so a defense of antitrust cases can be held at five levels. And this, uh, this will be true, uh, those ones that you are in the law school, you will learn these techniques very, very um, uh, specifically at some point. But for now, let me just give you a very short description of each one of them. You will see they work in a lot of things, can get you out uh, from a lot of trouble. Like even uh, with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you have trouble, you have done something bad, you can use those to defend yourself. Okay, that's like we're talking here about useful knowledge today. Okay, so defense of antitrust cases can be, again, at five levels. The first is that, Your Honor, I didn't do it. Okay, I don't know what they're talking about. I didn't do it. They, this uh, offense that they accused me for, I never did it. Okay, that's the first level. The second is that the practice is not against the law. I did it, but there was nothing illegal. The law says this, and I did that. How is this? Illegal. Okay, that's the second way to defend it. The third way is that, uh, yes, I did it. Yes, it was against the law, but actually didn't cause any problem at all because didn't alter the, uh, didn't create market power. So it didn't give me any benefit. And I knew that it's not going to give me any benefit because everybody else is doing it. And therefore I'm selling the same as I was selling before. At the same, I have the same profit like I had before, so it didn't give me any market power, it didn't give me any dominant position, just allowed me to compete in a way that all the competition was played back in the time. So yes, I did it. Yes, I know that this is against this regulation that uh, the antitrust authority has put down into, into a law, but in general, this didn't, didn't create any uh, market power. The fourth one, is that yes, I did it, yes, it created market power for me, but it didn't alter the final result in the market. So it didn't, uh, I do have market power, but still I have zero profit, let's say. Okay, or still my profit is the same like it was before or something like that. So yes, there was a result for this from this tactic, but this result did not made me better off than others, it didn't change the market outcome. It was a natural way of how competition was going back then. And the fifth level is to say, yes, I did it. Yes, it gave me my uh, market power. Yes, I gave me more profit than before. It altered the market outcome. But listen, I have the best product. I deserve that. Okay, I, I sold at a higher prices. I don't know why the others followed me. Okay, well, I didn't fix anything with them. I increased my prices and I put them at the same level like these other guys not because I wanted to, uh, to, to collude with somebody else, but because I improved my product so much, I advertised it or something like that, and therefore I should deserve to get a better outcome. This, there's no abuse here. So I do have market power, but there is no abuse of market power. So, of course, if you have a good lawyer, and this is super important, if you ever start a business, you should have, first of all, a good accountant, and secondly, a very good lawyer. You cannot do without these two. If you have, if you don't have a good economist, still okay. Who cares? 
Okay, but if you do not have a good lawyer or not a good accountant, you're gonna be in big trouble. You need like, a, a, these two things are imperative if you, if you want to succeed in business. All right, so if you have a good lawyer and you go to court because you're accused of something like that, of course your lawyer will tell you that, listen, we have to pick one of the five. You cannot like say, oh, your honor, I didn't do it, but then when I did it, it didn't alter the market outcome because one contradicts the other. There is only, only one person that this can, that can pull this off. Only one person can pull this off and have all five of those. And this person is Donald Trump. Okay, Donald Trump, the Donald is the only one who can do that. Like for example, he started in the beginning and he said, no, I never met this lady, Stormy Daniels. And then he said, um, you know, they came up with a picture that it's him and her together. Then said, um, yes, I know her, but I, haven't, I, ha I don't have any other relationship with her. Then he was like, um, okay, yes, I know her and I paid her some uh, money, but this was not hush money. It's like, um, then she produces the check and everything that said, like even the check, hush money there. Said, yes, I, I paid her the money, but I didn't do what people accused me to do because um, she was an adult movie star and I don't like these things because I'm a, a very good president and everything like that. So he tried, like he went all five steps one by one, still people bought it. Okay, like most of his voters, they were pretty okay. He explained it perfectly. Same thing he did uh, with a with a phone call to the to the Russian uh, to the Russian uh, president. He said no, no, I never talked to the guy. And then he was like, yes, I talked to him, but I never talked to him about like withholding funding towards his country because I wanted to uh, I wanted him to dig some dirt for for my opponent. It's like yes, I did it, but it was normal. And then I did it because Biden was doing these things also, and it went down the road like all the time. He follows all five methods always works for him, but you are not him, okay? You are not him and therefore, uh, unfortunately, you have to pick only one. All right, so um, here's an example, poking hole to a price fixing scheme. So you're accused of price fixing. Like, okay, uh, your honor, we're fixing the prices, but we are fixing them at a reasonable markup. This markup is 30%. So if you go to another country and see how much is the markup, of similar companies to similar products, you will see that they are 30%. Here is what happens in Norway, here's what happens in South Africa, here's what happens in Australia, and you make this case that it's a reasonable markup. Okay, yes, we did fix the price, yes, we discussed about that, but we are not abusing anything, we're doing everything that is happening around the world and we are not like trying to take advantage of anything differently in uh, what other companies in other countries are doing. Um, you can say that if we do not fix the prices, we cannot offer pre-sale services. Meaning that, your honor, if I offer the product with good pre-sale service, like the customer will come and I will explain everything, how this uh, camera, for example, works and uh, you want to buy a digital camera and I will tell you, okay, so if you want to take good pictures for portraits, get this. If you want to get uh, like uh, video also, you should get this. If you want uh, this to be easy, you can get a camcorder. If you, so you give them instruction, like you talk to them like for, for 10, 15 minutes till they decide which camera they should get. And then I offer all this good service. And because I offer this service and I pay my employees as they should pay because they are specialized in cameras. And then the customer takes all the information and goes to the other, to the other, uh, to the other store that doesn't have any uh, salespeople that they know what they are doing and they are working in minimum wage and they buy it from there now that they got information from me. How can I prevent that unless we fix the prices? If we fix the price, we have the same price me and the same price him, then we compete into pre-sale services as we said last time in Oligopoly. So we do fix the price, but we do it because we want to maintain the service at the level that the product will sell more widely and we will increase our profits like that because 
we make consumers to want to buy a, pro a product not because we are selling at higher prices. The prices are just enough to cover the high cost that we have for the pre-sale services. So this is a, an excuse that Apple has used and it was very successful because Apple, as we uh, said as an example last time, they put the prices of, of their phones in every country. It's super difficult to find a better price than the one that the Apple store sells or the one that they... Uh, that the stores that they have, that they are recognized by Apple, they are, they are uh, endorsed by Apple, are, are selling for. Okay, so because you do not have any other reason to go to a third-party store and buy it from cheaper there that they do not offer such good service. Uh, the efficiency gains offset the dead weight loss. Say, okay, listen, I understand that from monopolizing the product, there is some dead weight loss, but by offering the product in this way, uh, for example, pharmaceutical companies say, yes, I do price my medication very expensive. And then I had uh, almost 10 billion in profit last year, but nine and a half of this billion, they went back in research for this new medication. And I use this money in order to come up with new life-saving uh, therapies for the future, then this would be an excuse that will go a long way with the regulator. And the regulator would be like, the, the authority would be, Sure, I understand that. I cannot deprive you for the future money for research. Okay, so there might be legitimate ways to have a very successful defense, even to fix the prices, obviously, but to have a very good reason to do that. And once you explain it, you get away with it. In some cases, it will not even go to court if you have such a good excuse like that. The prosecutor has better things to do than taking you to court and losing this. Okay, they made offer, let's say, in the... Worst case scenario, they will offer you like a, a ridiculously low settlement. You'd like, okay, pay us like a million out of those 10 billion and you are free to go and just, you know, do it less next year or something like that. Okay, but in general, these are, um, these are uh, developments that happen in, you know, they depend to interaction between people. Usually they happen how we describe them here. Sometimes you might have like political interests and we want to prosecute you, not because you did something bad, but because, you know, you also own a newspaper and you write very negative things for us. So we'll come after your other company. Things like that happen a lot around the world, even in very developed economies. Okay, so you have things that you see, because sometimes students come to me and say, okay, in this case, you know, this happened and this is not consistent with the economic theory, yes. If you have other interests that they are behind and you look only the, the top of the iceberg, then uh, it may look different. But in reality, if there is nothing else interfering with economic interests, this is pretty much what is going to happen. But again, there is a room for interaction here and you can have uh, various results. Now, the, let's talk a little bit about the antitrust legislation. I want to give you a sense of what is legal and what is not legal, what you can do and what you cannot do. And the reason that I want to explain this is because it's very natural for people to know, okay, um, it's illegal if you kill, it's illegal if you steal, it's illegal even if you uh, download a movie because you do not deprive the movie from somebody who has it already, but you actually deprive money from the person who produced this movie. So these are kind of simple things for everybody to understand. But when you go to somebody and you tell them that, it doesn't matter that this is your company. It doesn't matter that the other person who has the company is your friend and you come up with an agreement and you decide to set the price at the monopoly level. It's your company and you set whatever price you want, but you cannot coordinate the price with others. This is illegal. And sometimes people do not really believe that. It's not natural for them to believe it. And this is the reason why I want to very briefly for five minutes cover a little bit the legislation so you will see what actually is allowed and, and some things that you believe that it's your right to do. Actually, it's not your right to do and some people have gone to jail for that. Uh, antitrust laws are rules and regulations that they are designed to promote a competitive economy by either prohibiting actions anything that can restrain the trade and hinder the competition, or restricting the forms of the market, changing the form of the market. So you can say, you cannot do this, 
or you can say this market structure right here is not allowed. Okay, so you can go against actions or you can go against structures of the market. So for example, several years ago in the United States, the, the antitrust authority would be like, oh, this company should break into three different parts. Like for example, one of the logic that prosecutors want to go against Google is that they will like, okay, what does Google have to do with the advertising part of the double click, the company that I bought several years ago for several billions that nobody knew what they're doing. And actually this is the mainstream of revenue right now for Google. Why is it the same company? One is the company that produces information, the other does advertising. They should be totally different. By integrating them, you just create market power in this way. Or what does Google have to do with YouTube? They can break. So you had these cases that the, uh, the government will come and say, no, no, no. This market structure here, this one company that does everything should break into seven different parts. Like the telecommunication industry back in the 60s, they broke the, uh, the companies to the seven sisters, eight sisters, I don't remember. So they broke like the companies to several smaller companies that they should compete with each other. So market power arises in a number of ways. And each of these ways is addressed by the law. I will start with the American law. And I will start with the American law for two reasons. First of all, the American law was the first. And it's probably the first law that doesn't have to do with basic criminal law. The first legislation that actually survived for so long and seems like it's going to survive for maybe thousands of years. So it's never going to change, like at least its basic logic. And secondly, because this legislation actually has um, uh, has created the, uh, the structure, the, the frame of every other law that exists right now in the world. So if you know what happens with the American antitrust law, you pretty much know 99% of what happens in the rest of the economies and in the rest of the antitrust authorities because they are pretty similar with some small differences that I will explain to you and they have to do with um, especially the Singapore case, which is a little different, but I will just point out the differences. So the first law I want to talk about is the Sherman Act, which was voted in place in 1890. This is actually a pretty long time ago. This is a time that most of the economics that you have seen today, for example, all these models, everything that we talked about today, was pretty much unknown to people back then. And the natural question that we have here is why people back then, that they knew very little about economics, they wanted to sit down and write a law and actually did such a good job that this law, even today, 130 years later, it actually still works. It was so good, they did so good job that it actually works even today. Why did they decide to do that from back then? The reason was that this was about the time that the Industrial Revolution had finished and had created some companies that they had started to become monsters. Like, for example, the company of Rockefeller that had become so big that it was just one click away from becoming the dominant power in the policy, the economy, the uh, legislation, everything in the United States. The company was so big that could, do, could, could be an alternative form of authority in the entire country. So they decided that if we do not limit this thing that's going on with huge monopoly power that these companies are gaining, we will lose control of the country. Democracy will lose the control of the country at some point. So they came up with the Sherman Act. Uh, Section one prohibits agreements contracts or conspiracies in restraint of trade. This is very important because if you just prohibit a contract between two parties, like I prohibit that we should have a contract that fixes the price. Okay, so nobody can have a contract that fixes the price or limits the quantity or does anything collusive like that. This has to do with explicit agreements that they restrict output or fixed prices, but also implicit collusion through parallel conduct. So even if you never meet the other person, but you just price in a way that you just reflect everything that the other person is doing, you just follow some leader in the pricing, 
This is also illegal. It's parallel conduct. Like, why do you fix the price? This price fixing, even though you never had an agreement. Um, Section 2 prohibits conspiracies that they result in monopolization. And from this, we can understand the spirit of the law. So it's okay if a firm gets the entire market because of superior skill and intelligence when nobody else could do it as good as the other firms were doing it. So for example, this is uh, what uh, big companies usually uh, go with in the court. They say, Your Honor, I'm Apple, I'm producing this phone that is very superior for everybody else. People love my product. I have made it so that I have a, a relationship with my customers that my customers would be like, please, Apple, take our money and give us like anything that you can. And I'm able to sell uh, $300 small uh, uh, earphones that everybody else is selling like for $50 or $60. Okay, so I did this because of superior skill and intelligence, not because of any other reason. What is not okay is if you do it for the other reason, use of means which made it impossible for others to compete. Like for example, usually there was the uh, Swiss hotel in, uh, in the United States and they were accused for doing something which is one of the most trashy things I ever heard for any company doing. So Swiss hotels, they had, um, uh, they had uh, GSM blockers and they were installing those in the hotel and they would just make the signal from the internet, the, the, uh, the satellite internet that you're getting through your phone, your internet through the, uh, the telecommunications company, they would make it very weak. So you would be forced to buy the Wi-Fi card that they will give you internet and you will be able to be connected uh, because you saw that your phone didn't have internet. It had signal, GSM signal normally, but it didn't have internet. So you were going to this hotel and you're like, oh, I have no internet, I don't know why. Uh, Yes, uh, we don't have a good reception here for some reason, some mysterious reason. Uh, you can buy our card, which is $10 a day, and you will have uh, our perfect Wi-Fi. If indeed there is no internet, you, know, you are selling your Wi-Fi and you're pricing it that much, that's something that it's up to your consumers to buy it or to not buy it. But if you actually cut the signal, so you will be able to sell your Wi-Fi card. That's really a trashy thing. And I was very, very happy that I heard that this, um, uh, this uh, hotel company actually got a huge fine and they were shamed into just stopping that immediately. And I think they had a lot of backlash actually uh, from this as well. Now, uh, a few years later, the Clayton Act updated the policy by prohibiting suppliers to require the buyers to not buy from a competitor. Like I told you, Coca-Cola was doing that. Coca-Cola was like, I will give you my products to sell only if you sign a contract that you are not going to be selling the other company. With the Sherman Act, this was not illegal. So a lot of companies were doing it with competing companies. The same, of course, did Pepsi, but because Pepsi was not as... Um, efficient in Coca with Coca-Cola in that, they were much, uh, much more able to do it. Actually, Coca-Cola was doing this around the whole world. I remember this um, was something that in Greece, it became illegal in 1960s. I was not born in the 1960s, but because the antitrust legislation in Greece moved very slowly, and actually companies were still getting away by doing that. I remember when I was a kid in the 90s, uh, you would go around like in remote areas, not in the in Athens or in uh, uh, major cities in Greece, but you could go in remote areas, and then those places they would not have they would not have um, uh, both of the drinks. They would have only one, even though they were like, for example, they had their own fridges, they had their own uh, ways to store the uh, the beverages. They could have both of them. But Coca Cola would go there and say, "Yeah, I'll give you a better price, which was the market price, only." if you promise that you do not have Pepsi. If I come back and I see Pepsi, they didn't have a contract because it was illegal, but they were still doing it. And they stopped recently, like they stopped it entirely. Now, in my channel on YouTube, I have a video. Uh, it was the first video I ever shot with, uh, with my iPhone uh, back then that is called uh, Exclusive Territories with um, Refrigerator, something like that. And I explained how Coca-Cola and Pepsi, they kept doing exactly the same thing afterwards by not having you to sign a contract or giving you a different price, but by giving you as a present a refrigerator. 
And they said, okay, we're giving you this free refrigerator. It's our, our refrigerator. You can use it as you want for our beverages, of course, but you cannot put beverages of another company. Now, the refrigerator was acting as a placeholder. Most of the places that they were selling uh, those drinks, they had space problems. They could not have each refrigerator of every company. So once you put your refrigerator there with Coca-Cola, then the other company will come to you. Oh, do you want our refrigerator too? Well, well, I already have one. It consumes a lot of electricity. You know, it takes all my space. I will keep the one. So they were doing the same thing without context. So always the companies, they try to find the same way to do it with um, go from another way. And after some point, the European Union came out and said, no, you cannot do even this with the refrigerators. And they said, if you have a refrigerator that is owned by another firm, then you can use, let's say, the, I think the 20% of the space to store anything else that you want, including products from a competitive company. So now you can see some fridges of Coca-Cola that they have a little bit of Pepsi inside and they are totally legal. And actually, this was something that was enforced. Once I had met um, uh, somebody, I was, I was uh, uh, going for a vacation and I met a guy and um, uh, he was uh, driving a motorbike like I did. And we started a little chat. And I was like, what do you, what do, you do? And it's like, I work for Coca-Cola. I was like, oh, that's interesting. What do you do for Coca-Cola? It's like, I inspect fridges. It's like, you are a fridge inspector? Like, what, if they have the right temperature and stuff like that? It's like, yes, that too, but I go to a different place. I travel all the time and he was going like there with his motorbike. He was coming to your store that you were, there was paperwork that you had the fridge and he would come to your store and would look inside the fridge. Like how many Pepsi do you have in a Coca-Cola fridge? And if you do not, uh, do not have the right amount, they will be like, okay, so you violated our policy. Next time, we're not gonna give you that good uh, price. And this was something that was not against the antitrust because say, okay, sorry, we have a contract. I gave you a fridge. You signed the contract for that because it's a free fridge. And this comes with the contract. So they always find ways to, to try to work around that. You have to understand, especially from today's lecture, it should become clear to you one of the most important things to understand in economics. Economics is a marginal science, meaning that we talk about marginal cost, marginal revenues, and all these marginal things. It's like, why do we bother so much with the marginal? Because if you want to make money, to maximize your profit, you have to work at the margin, including the margin of the law. You have to be like at the very corner of the law that one more step would make you illegal. And if you are once just one little step in the gray area between legal and illegal, it means that you maximize your profits there. So everything is marginal, even how you see the law. That's one of the lessons that you can get out of this. So mergers and acquisitions are prohibited by the, by the Clayton Act if they substantially lessen competition or they tend to create a monopoly. Predatory pricing. What is predatory pricing? Pretty simple. Predatory pricing is when a firm prices below its own cost, not the cost of the opponent, its own cost. I'm saying that because this was the most usual mistake last year that this was in the final exam. Okay, so you price below your cost, making losses because you know that your cost is also as pretty much as low as the cost of the opponent or even lower or a little higher, but you price below so you want to make incur losses, but you know that your rival also incurs losses, but you have bigger pockets, deeper pockets than your opponent. So you say, I'm gonna resist this, I keep incurring the losses, I'm going to take it for as long as it needed, but the other person doesn't have the ability to keep funding the losses for so long. So they will go out of business, and once they go out of business, I will monopolize the market, I will try to impose barriers so they will not come back here, and then I will raise the price. Okay, so you have, for example, this other coffee shop on the other side of the square. You imply predatory pricing till the other guy will be like, sorry, I cannot fund the loss anymore. I'm out of here. So once this person is out of here, you rent this place, you make it a hairdresser for uh, your cousin to, to go work there, and then you raise the price once this person cannot come back. 
So this is called predatory pricing and is also illegal. If you prove that the other person is doing it, the other person can have very serious consequences. The Federal Trade Commission Act came at the same year, 1914, and it was for the first time that uh, in the United States they said that normal prosecutors in every state, they are not capable to take these cases. We should create an agency of prosecutors that they will take these cases because they are highly specialized. They need people that they know good economics. They need people that they know what happens in the market. Uh, you cannot prosecute a, a rape in one day and a, a homicide in the other day, and then in the third day go do an antitrust case. So you have to have specialized prosecutors. But then this authority actually took other duties several additional duties like, for example, deceptive advertising, deceptive uh, labeling, agreements to exclude competing brands from retailing, and all these things that we talked about before. Now, in Singapore, things are very similar. The competition law that governs all non-state businesses in Singapore is the Competition Act. It's just one law that has several different uh, sections but it's everything under a particular law. So in Singapore, when you bring a law, you just cancel the previous one, you bring the new one. It was voted in 2004, it came into effect in uh, uh, 2007, in 1st of July, and this was a, a legislation that actually had everything. According to my knowledge, and I have, I have consulted on antitrust cases before, it's something that I have uh, being in depositions in court for real antitrust cases. I have read a lot of things about the law. I have talked to a lot of lawyers with respect to that. And actually, I can tell you that the Singapore law is the most complete and the, the best law I have ever seen. It has some, some amazing provisions there that they are uh, the, the best of the best that you cannot find them in, in uh, many, many other developed countries. And we will go over them. All right, so the Act, um, of course, prevents unfair trade practices and restricts the formation of cartels and monopoly activity. And it's modeled after the UK Competition Act of 1998, but has elements for many other uh, legislation around the world, but has also some very brand new features that no other places have. So it's not only a result of the UK law, it's um, several other things that they are there and they make a difference. It has also a very important difference from the American law that I will point it out and you will see that is super crucial because even uh, professors of economics, sometimes they tell me, why do you teach antitrust for Singapore? Like antitrust in Singapore is not that different from anywhere else. And I'm like, no, actually antitrust in Singapore has some unique features that nowhere else in the world you have those features. And you will see exactly what I'm talking about in, in a few minutes. All right, so in Singapore, antitrust is monitored by the uh, Consumer Commission of Singapore. This is how it used to be called till recently, the CCS. Then they decided that the Cs are not enough and they had to put another one. So now it's CCCS, like keep saying C till you get tired and then say S, and that's the competition authority. So the CCCS uh, is a statutory body. Okay, so it's not just a simple authority, it's a statutory body. It's like, for example, like the police. This means that they have the, a statutory body, uh, other than a simple commission, for example, has the ability to impose direct fines. And then this is not like the FTC, for example, which is not a statutory body. The FTC can actually come to you and say, okay, so you either pay me this fine, but if you don't want, we go to court and the court decides how much, if you, are, if you are guilty or not guilty, and if you are guilty, how much you will pay for compensation for doing that. All right, so you have this situation there. But here, things are different because now you have a statutory body and the statutory body can say, okay, so dear Uber and dear Grab, uh, you tried to merge and you merged and then I think that this is a violation of law, so you have to pay a fine of some million dollars. Okay, and they impose this fine, which is payable immediately by a deadline that they actually set to you. So this is what a statutory body can do. Like for example, the police can come and say, okay, Cosmos, you are, uh, you are um, under arrest because you did that. They will not be like, oh, Cosmos, do you want to be under arrest? Or I should take you to the court and see what is uh, blah, blah, going to do. So you, 
you cross the red light, so this automatically gives me the ability to give you this fine, and then you cannot really contest that. There are some ways to contest that, and the same ways hold here, but this is a crucial difference. Hold it because it's going to make a difference. So it has powers to directly impose sanctions that include penalties. So I can give you a penalty directly for doing that. Uh, for structural changes, like for example, we say, okay, so grab, you have these uh, uh, two different smaller entities inside that they do different things than all the services that you are selling, one financial and one other that does reservations for limos and stuff like that. These are separate companies. They have to, uh, to be independent from you. So their owners can actually own all three, but they cannot be under one company umbrella because they coordinate like that. All right, if they can terminate agreements or business practices that they think that they are anti-competitive, they just issue an order that you should be stopping doing that or else you're in violation and you will be facing even more serious consequences. And in Singapore, this makes, has a result that the burden of proof now goes, is shifted to the defendant. This is a huge difference because now I have to prove that I'm not an elephant. It's not like before. How does this happen? Look at that, how subtle the difference is, but how important it is in the end. So the CCS can unilaterally give you a fine, say, okay, Cosmas, you were uh, in an agreement with uh, uh, another, uh, another instructor to sell services for something, that, or your online uh, course, for example, you to sell it for that amount of money. And uh, I accuse you of price fixing, and I give you a fine of $100,000. Okay, this is a fine to me. Now they have given it to me. So now, it's like, okay, that's still fair, because if they are wrong and they're just trying to abuse you, you can still go to court. You can actually appeal and go to the uh, appellate court, and you would be like, okay, I got this fine, and this is unfair. But what happens in the appeal? In the appeal, you are the one that you accuse the CCCS that they didn't do their job right. So now you have to prove that they are wrong and they are, that they, they should not give you the fine. So now in the beginning, what are you? You are the defendant because they gave you the fine. But instead of going to the first level court and say, I'm here, just prove to me where I violated the law. You have to go directly to the appellate uh, court and you will be like, okay, so you gave me this court and I'm not guilty for this because one, two, three, four, five, and I should make a case. Now they have the right to remain silent and this is something that changes the whole situation entirely. All right, so in the appeal, the accused must make a case for innocence and this is the other way around than what it happens in the rest of the world. You'll be like, okay, so what's the big deal? You still can do it, you just have to prove it. Well, the problem with, um, with how institutions work, it's we design the institutions in every society, we design the institutions, not for the good times, when everything goes well, Sometimes you don't even need the institutions. Like for example, if everybody was a nice person, you wouldn't need to have a court. You wouldn't need to have a, a police. You wouldn't need to have even a government. Everybody would be doing the right thing. And then you would have somebody to just do the chore of organizing and say, hey guys, uh, from tomorrow, we're all wearing masks because uh, there is a pandemic. And everybody else would be like, sure, yeah, okay, here's my mask, let's start wearing masks. And that, that, that's it, that's all. So you're making institutions for the bad times, for when things are not going well. And sometimes, like for example, I had a very um, long time that I spent in Russia. In Russia, they also have a state-of-the-art antitrust law. It's almost as good in Singapore with a little less features and a little less modern, but almost entirely into accordance with the European Union. The problem is that they never use it, okay? except if the perpetrator is an enemy of the government. Okay, if you are uh, a monopolist and you are abusing your monopoly power and you are also a friend of Putin, nothing really happens there. 
But if you are on the other side and you criticize Putin, for example, then you will have the, uh, the Federal Commission of, of Anti-Monopoly, how they call it in Russia, you will have the Federal Commission of Anti-Monopoly to visit you almost every day, to harass you, to try to find something that you did, so they will uh, try to use the, the law against you. And this is how the institutions work. Like, you have to design them in the way that they will be proof in the hard times. Okay, so we have to have in mind how always, how can this be abused? This is important. If you have a benevolent government, then it doesn't matter. The law doesn't really matter. Okay, if you have if you have leadership that always wants to do the best, then nothing really matters. Okay, you will see that the, the place will prosper. The problem is when you start having the personal and the political interests that they come above all this, and then you need to have the check and balances that they will work. And the authority for the antitrust in every country is one of these important balances. That's very important job in the, in the economy every time. And that's why we have to know about them. All right, so what happens with the act on, against antitrust in Singapore? Uh, Section 34 is against collusion, prohibits anti-competitive activities. Like for example, even attending a cartel meeting, you just, you say, okay, I came to this cartel meeting just to see what the others are gonna do. I'm not going to, to collude. Even this is illegal. Uh, agreements that directly fix prices, uh, they are purchasing prices or selling prices, they are also illegal, they are against uh, the law. Agreements that limit production to, to cut down production like monopolies do or cut down technological progress or investment or sources of supply, they are also uh, they are also against the, uh, the Act, uh, the Section 34. Sharing of market of resources of supply, like for example, to say, okay, so you will have, uh, you, I will share the market into different segments. You will get the one side, I will get the other, like for example, with the internet providers that we saw last time in the US. This is totally illegal. Bid rigging or collusive tendering. This is when you fix the bidding for something that is sold. Like for example, something is sold in an auction and you say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We are going to bid up to that price and whoever buys the asset will take advantage of the asset and share the profit with everybody else that was in the agreement. So this is illegal. Actually, there was a case uh, recently in Singapore where companies were caught and they were fined very heavily because of they were doing exactly that. They were uh, uh, doing bid rigging and they were uh, prosecuted with section 34 of the act. The next interesting section of the Competition Act is section 47 against the abuse of dominant position. Section 47 reveals the intent of the legislator towards what constitutes abuse of dominant position. So it's actually pretty similar to what the Sherman Act revealed, what is the intent of the legislator. It prohibits conduct that protects, enhances, or perpetuates market power in ways that they are unrelated to competitive merit, and does not prevent you from striving to achieve dominant position by just offering a cheaper or a better product. So section 47 specifically prohibits predatory behavior, agreements that impose the similar condition to the same kind of transactions between different trading parties. In other words, imagine that I have my own company and my company produces something that is used as an input by two other companies, company A and company B. So I sell, for example, oil, let's say, to company A and to company B. If company A belongs to me and I give them better prices, then this means that company A has an advantage, a cost advantage against company B that doesn't belong to me and I don't care. So I say, okay, so guys, I'm selling oil. So I sell to my company very cheap and I sell to the other company more expensive. So actually I affect the terms of the competition between them. This actually is against the law. Agreements that impose the similar condition to equivalent transactions with different trading parties, they are prohibited. For example, I can go to court and I say, yes, but my company bought more 
than this other company. That's why I give them a discount. Then this is okay. But if they bought the same and I give different prices, this is not okay. Again, we're talking here about the law and there are many ways. That's why I told you you have to have a good lawyer because there are many ways that you can talk your way out of this kind of, of logic here and, not, and, and explain something in a way that doesn't seem illegal anymore. And this is what good lawyers actually do. They have a way of explaining things that they don't seem so much illegal anymore. And we have seen this in several cases. Parallel conduct from a group with an intention to influence the competitor's uh, position, like for example, getting uh, a bunch of companies together and bullying another company out of the market, this is also uh, not legal. The final section that is interesting for us is section 54 that has to do with the restrictions of mergers. So it bars mergers and acquisitions when they result to concentration of high market power. Competition concerns from a merger will arise only when, if you have a share of 40% and above, then automatically this will raise some eyebrows there and you will be like uh, under investigation most likely. So if you have, for example, you have 25% and you want to merge with somebody who has 20%, then the entity will come up with a market power that is way too much to not be investigated. Again, it can be permitted under specific circumstances, but it will be investigated, it will be concerning the authority. Even if you are not to 40%, if you are above 20% and the market share of the three larger firms is 70% or more, so you are creating another big firm in already existing many big firms, then this will raise again concern and you might be investigated. Uh, a third reason that you can be investigated, the merger gives a rise to coordinated behavior because the number of players in the market are reduced. And then uh, another way is the merger will result in price increase in the industry. So if it's obvious that you are doing the merger just because you want to increase the prices and there is no other reason, then again, you will be under investigation. Unless the commission can come up with a very robust reasoning for one of these four, you will not be under investigation. So you can actually, most of the mergers that they happen every day, they never bother the antitrust authority at all. The antitrust authority doesn't even uh, care about them. But there are some particular ones that they will attract a lot of attention because one of these four things happened. And finally, interested parties are allowed to ask for a confidential preliminary verdict by the CCCS before they will decide to announce a merger. This is what I was talking to you about before that is a unique feature that at least to my knowledge doesn't exist in any other antitrust act. And this is that you can ask, you can pay actually the commission. Uh, I think the, uh, the tariff for that is $25,000 in Singapore, which if you are talking about a merger that will be for companies that they're worth several millions each, it's not that much money. So the commission will investigate if they will allow you to, to merge and they will announce this to you before they announce it to anybody else. Now, why is this important? In order to understand it, because I don't want to go to any uh, difficult explaining of game theory concepts here, I will tell you an example, and I'm sure that you will understand a real example, and you will understand it. A few years ago, the two biggest Greek banks, they were in very deep trouble. The problem with the banks is that you don't want to announce your troubles out there. And you don't want to announce them because the, one of the basic concepts of banking is that people trust you and that's why they come to you and be like, here's my money, hold it till I need it. Okay, you, you need to have a serious amount of trust with somebody to go and do that. So the, it was not that they were going out of business the next day and people will lose their money, but they were already on the red and they had to do something to go out of the situation. So they decide to try for a merger. Now, when, once you are the two biggest in something, the two biggest companies in, in an industry, you have to make very good arguments in order to merge or else you are not going to be allowed from the national authority. So the two banks went there and they said, listen, we are in big trouble. 
and unless we, we are allowed to merge, they, we, we, it's difficult for us to survive. They said that because they wanted really to merge. So the Antitrust Commission looked into the subject. This got a lot of publicity already. Oh, look at that, the two biggest banks are, are merging and everything. There was a lot of discussion about it. And at some point, the Antitrust Commission, under the directions also of the European Union, they went and they said, sorry guys, this is completely against the law. Actually, there are no serious reasons for you to, to, to merge and we will not allow you to merge. So they did not allow them to merge. But now, everybody in the economy knows what? That these two big banks, they actually are not doing very well. So what is natural for people to do? To just go to these banks and they just take their money from there and put it in another third, fourth, fifth bank that they were doing much better and the money was safer there. This effort for merging and solving the problem actually created a bigger problem. If this was in place though, and they could go to the authority and be like, here's 25,000, here's our, our folder, just check if you will allow us or not. If you allow us, we'll go out and say, we are merging, we're not doing that well before, but now we'll be strong and we'll come out of this much stronger and we'll be a very good bank. So this would be super good for these banks, but in case they do not allow you, you're like, okay, forget about it. If you're not allowing me, you're not allowing me. I'm trying to fight my problems without having an additional problem of having all these people to do a bank run to me and just taking the money. And now I have even less assets to try to leverage my position outside of this uh, uh, bad situation that I'm now. All right, so this brings me to the external video. So it's a very interesting video. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of perspective and you will also see the politics that happen uh, behind the antitrust and why I told you before that sometimes it's good to have the checks and balances because you really need them. All right, so uh, the next video that we will have to talk about is the externalities. Uh, this is a picture that I took from uh, the day of the fog. It was that day that you were going out and uh, you would see that the sun was red. I think it happened a year and a half ago or something like that. And the sun was red and I was, I went out for a run and I was running and then everybody was wearing masks and this was before the COVID-19. And I was like, why are these people afraid of these strange clouds that they are in the, in the air? And then I went back home and I saw the news and it was this uh, pollution of the air situation that was really bad. Uh, video number six explains what happens when the costs and utility uh, do not stay entirely with those taking part in the market process, but spills over to parties that they are outside of this market by standards. It's a pretty explanatory tutorial video. You will uh, go through the slides and I think that you will understand everything. It has um, many examples that they will allow you to understand exactly the concepts of externality and what uh, means to have an externality failure. All right, and finally, let's talk about public goods. A good is public when two conditions apply. The first is that the good is non-excludable. This means that the producer cannot prevent users that they do not pay for the good to use this good. An example for this is private security. Like for example, imagine that you live in a building in the apartment 13, and then there is a company that offers security in this building. And you are the only tenant that you say, no guys, sorry, I do not pay for security. I do not need security. Everybody else wants security, they pay for security, but then the security company cannot actually exclude you. So if a burglar comes, for example, the security person will not be like, okay, are you a burglar? Okay, I, I see that you're a burglar. All right, listen. You do not go in this building to any apartment other than the apartment 13, because this guy doesn't pay. You can go there, but the others pay, so I have to, uh, they have to be secure. So you can go to this guy, but not to the other guys. So you cannot do that, so the product is non-excludable. The second one is that the good is non-rival. This means that consumption of the good by one consumer does not really prevent other consumers from consuming the same good. A good is, non-rival when you, by using it, doesn't deprive others 
physically from the unit of the good. Again, security can be an example for that. Like for example, the tenant of the apartment 17 pays for the security and enjoys the security. This doesn't prevent uh, me from enjoying the same good because I don't pay, but I still am able to enjoy it. And by me enjoying it doesn't take away from anybody else that is enjoying this good. As you probably understand, private firms have little interest in producing such goods because it will be difficult mainly to get paid for this. And this is because you have a problem that usually is referred to the literature as the free rider problem, meaning that users prefer to use the good without paying. So in the security of the building example, we can imagine a situation that I will not pay because I know that others need security. So they will hire security people and they will also protect me. But if everybody thinks like that, then security will never be hired in this particular building. So the problem of the free rider actually creates a lot of problems in bigger communities because if you are in a building and you're like 30 tenants, you can get together and be like, okay, so this guy who doesn't want to pay is this particular person and shame on him or her for not doing that. But if you are talking about a society of millions, like uh, there is the culture, for example, in Greece, you can brag to your friends for finding ways to not pay your taxes. And pretty much the same can happen in the United States, not so much in Singapore. So the mentality of people sometimes they even elevate the free rider thing to, to, having, to have even uh, bragging rights about something. Like it's good that, listen, I got the service, but I didn't pay for that. These are goods that usually, unless you solve the problems of non-excludability or non-rivalry, you will not be able to trade those goods. In general, uh, the most important public goods are provided by the government. So government can fund public goods uh, through taxation. The provision of public goods is one of the fundamental reasons of the existence, actually, of the government. And this is very important. Even the, uh, the libertarians, the people that they consider that government is totally useless, they say, okay, one use of the government is the provision of the public goods. Because two things that they are sure in life uh, the first is death and the second is taxes. So the government does collect taxes from people and they do have the ability to fund everything for everybody because you cannot say no to taxes. Well, you can say no, for example, that I don't want to pay for a private military. So here are some examples of public goods. National defense, again, the most classic example, because it's... Uh, by definition, non-excludable. So for example, you cannot say, oh, when the enemies come, uh, put like red arrows in the house of people, okay, bomb here and do not bomb there because this guy is paying for our military. Okay, this is not gonna work. If you, if you actually protect the nation, you protect the entire nation, you cannot exclude somebody out of that. Internal security and order like the police, infrastructure, uh, for example, when you create ports, when you build roads, courts, actually, even your right to defend yourself is a public good. The health system in many countries, the health system is almost entirely public. In some other countries, the public and the private system, they coexist. For example, like in Singapore, you always have to pay a contribution, but the government covers the most of the cost there. And finally, education. Education, at least in many countries, there is a public part, uh, the most basic part of the education that is totally public. This is because sometimes you want to prevent the situations like somebody can say, okay, I also went to school and what did I learn? Nothing. Was I able to get a better job? No. Where did I use what I learned in school? Nowhere. So why do I have to pay and send my kids to school? I prefer to not pay for that and just buy more food for my kids or just uh, gamble the money or do whatever I want. So some people can say that, but you don't want this to be able to be an excuse and uh, those people to not pay for education of the kids or everybody else. So you have to make this a public good to guarantee at least that there will be the minimum standards of education in this particular nation. So this was the topics for today's lecture. We started getting much closer to the real 
uh, economy, to the real life, to examples that they have to do with things that you hear around you almost every day. And this is something that, unfortunately, if I had more time to spend on microeconomics, I would be very happy to go even to more topics like that, that they will be much more interesting than the base theory that we did so far. But you understand that the theory is also necessary because if we didn't know the theory, it would be impossible to explain everything that we explain today and to understand it. From the next time, lecture seven, we will start the macroeconomic part of the course. And I think at least from what most students say, most students think that it's more interesting than the microeconomics. Uh, this was everything I had to say about the microeconomic part. Now, in the macroeconomics, we will start examining the economy as a whole, and we'll talk about unemployment, we'll talk about inflation, we'll talk about crisis, we'll talk about very interesting topics. So uh, stick together with the course. I want to see you next time. Keep watching the videos, follow the materials, uh, join the live streams, and I will see you in the next lecture.